So what's the plan? Should we, are we waiting for the chair? Actually, waiting our chairperson, but uh, since we are starting to be on time, probably would be better. well. We we have only four talks actually, so it's possible to wait a couple of minutes. Still. I'm also happy to start and we can have a chair, you know, hopefully the chair will come in for, you know, because we got to we got to worry about, you know, that the next speaker, he, you know, he's trouble. So we can we can start with me and I'll try to finish on time and then Pablo, you know, we can get a chair to, we'll, you know, rein in Pablo in his talk. Yeah. Well. Okay, maybe it's best to start now. Yeah, so let me just the temperature. Let me introduce our first speaker today, as uh, Chris Fryer uh, from Los Alamos, and he's going to speak about probes of the progenitors, engines, and physics behind stellar collapse. Uh, the stage is yours, please. And you can hear me well and see my slides. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm talking about uh, the physics of supernova and what we know about it and what you know observations are helping us understand that physics. And I just have some pictures of, I'm from Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, the, on the left is a picture of the lab. Um, on the right, are, there's a ski hill five miles away. This is uh, skiing down that ski hill. This, this ski hill was founded by Hans Bethe. Um, he's one of the uh, initial people that helped uh, form this into a ski hill. Um, and there's also a lot of Indian uh, ruins in Los Alamos area. So if you ever want to visit, contact me um, and we can set up a visit. Um, so what I wanted to talk about is uh, core collapse supernova and what we know about them then. Um, the idea is that the, these are explosions that happen at the end state of massive, at least some massive stars. Um, the proposal that uh, Zwicky proposed in 1934 for the, the energy for this um, violent explosion was the collapse of a massive star down to a neutron star. So they had just realized what a neutron was in the uh, early 1930s, and Zwicky almost immediately proposed, well, a massive star might uh, eventually collapse down to it because it gets, can't support itself. It will it will collapse down from this iron core down into essentially a, a star made out of neutrons. So you, you'll get electron capture under protons and that the potential energy release is gonna drive the explosion. And definitely there's enough potential energy there, um, but it was, it was all you know, kind of hand wavy theory. Um, people were making more and more sophisticated models, doing more and more detailed calculations but it was all theory really to try to explain these objects until 1987. And in 1987, we had a supernova go off. It was in the Magellanic Cloud, so it was nearby. Um, we had a number of detectors. We actually had seen the progenitor prior to collapse. So on the, on the right here is Sandulic minus 69202, which is the progenitor of this uh, explosion. And then we saw the explosion. Well, we actually, we, the, the way we saw the progenitor is we saw the explosion, then went back to um, images of the Magellanic clouds and pulled out the progenitor. So this, was, this really made a revolution in our models of core collapse supernova. It confirmed that you, it was something that was a collapse down to a compact object um, because we detected neutrinos. So we had a, a burst of neutrinos it's pretty hard to make that burst of neutrinos from anything but 
they collapse down to some kind of compact object. Um, it, we observed the progenitor star. So we knew it was getting produced from the end state of a massive star. But it had a lot of, it brought a lot of questions as well. So on the right here is the neutrino observation. It had a lot of questions that we didn't understand. One was the progenitor was not a red, giant, red supergiant. It was a blue supergiant. So it wasn't what we expected for the progenitor. Um, and I'll talk about some of these in more detail. The gamma rays that appeared appeared way earlier than we thought they would appear. And I'll tell you why we thought they would appear um, uh, later. Um, they also, there were a whole bunch of, the lines were more redshifted than we expected them to be. We expected them, the explosion to be moving at us, with the brightest material moving at us, and we would see these blue shifted lines. Um, so we had a number of observations that we just didn't understand. Um, and that really spurred on um, new models for, for the, uh, the engine behind core collapse supernova. Um, so let me just go into detail about the, the one observation that I mentioned before on the gamma rays arriving earlier than we thought they would. So the gamma rays from supernova, we expect them to come from the decay of radioactive nickel. So nickel 56 is produced right near that, the, the star collapses down to a neutron star, right above that neutron star surface, we get conditions that are extremely hot. And we expect these high temperatures to put this material into nuclear statistical equilibrium. And it's going to take whatever's falling in, so it's a silicon shell, and it's going to take that silicon shell and burn it up to nickel 56. And um, we'll get a whole bunch of nickel 56 right near that the center part of, you know, just above that proto-neutron star. The explosion then moves out. This, this, you end up and by hook or crook, we're going to get energy from that, the potential energy we release, we're going to drive an explosion. But we expected that explosion to be the, the nickel that's made down near the bottom to be the slowest moving ejecta. And it's covered by this, this star of material. So we didn't expect the, to see the gamma rays until it got diffuse enough that the gamma rays could leak out. So initially, the gamma rays from these decaying nickel atoms are, are just getting absorbed by the, the outer envelope of the star. So um, Phil Pinto and uh, Stan Luby had a set of models for what the gamma rays should look like. And those models are the solid lines in this uh, diagram. And the diagram is going through time in the supernova. So the, the top left is 150 days, 200 days in the middle left, 250 days later in the um, uh, left bottom, and then on the top right is 300, then 500, and then 700 as I go down on the right. And so what they expected was around 250 days, the gamma, the gamma, the nickel starts to get into diffuse enough material that we can see the gamma rays. So the gamma rays are starting to come out. And then you're going to peak around 300 days. And then slowly as you run out of nickel, the nickel decays down to cobalt to, and then to um, iron 56. As you run out of the nickel and cobalt decay lines, you expect it to just dim and, and go away. What they saw was at around 150 days, we were already seeing some nickel uh, observations. And then by 200, we had a bright gamma ray um, uh, signal. So uh, earlier than we expected. Um, so this, the way, what almost everyone interpreted this as being is we needed some kind of mixing in the, um, in the supernova explosion. So we needed some kind of asymmetry. And asymmetries have been, played a huge role in our understanding of the supernova explosion. And I'm gonna go through just a little bit of the evidence that we had for asymmetries. One was this early uh, emergence of the, the gamma ray lines. Another was the, the lines were broader than we expected for the iron. So this is that, again, the nickel is decaying to cobalt and then to iron. The iron lines, we would expect those to be that material to be moving slowly, and it's actually moving fast because we see it in the broadness of the iron lines. So one model that people did is they looked at some kind of mixing in the explosion as the explosion moved out. So you take a spherically symmetric explosion and um, move it through uh, the star and look at the mixing there, and they say, can we explain those um, that breadth in the iron lines? So that's one of the asymmetries that we tried to explain. And it wasn't enough. 
So it couldn't just be that you had a, um, a surgically symmetric explosion going through and mixing, and uh, at least from the simulations. We also saw broad gamma ray lines, and they were redshifted. So the lines were not, it wasn't just that the lines were broad, it was that they were redshifted. So it was like that material is moving away from us. Um, so that, that had some clues to the asymmetries. We see asymmetries, and, and this, this is an interesting story because I'm using something that looks like a jet-like structure in these, um, the iron and the silicon. We see asymmetries in supernova remnants. So there, you know, there was something telling us that uh, supernova remnants also were showing us that there was something asymmetric about the explosion. Um, now, in this case, for this remnant, the asymmetry can be either in the explosion itself or it can be, be something that's asymmetric in the surroundings. So you have to, when you're seeing this data, you have to actually somehow interpret it and figure out which, which part of, you know, how, you're, how you are um, using that information to constrain your, um, constrain your models. Um, other evidence for asymmetries are the kicks that we see in uh, neutron stars and pulsars. So the fast velocities in um, pulsars also say that you must have some kind of asymmetry in the explosion. And what this led the theorists to start looking at was it cannot just be that the star has asymmetries in it and the explosion mixing in the explosion is driving these asymmetries. It has to be something asymmetric in the explosion. And Haram et al. in 1992 started to study asymmetries in the um, uh, explosion by looking at convection right above the proto-neutron star. So this is really early calculations where they've had an inner boundary that's supposed to be the proto-neutron star. And what they realized is after the, the star collapses and bounces, so it collapses down to a neutron star, there's a bounce as the, the neutron star suddenly, um, the neutron degeneracy pressure, nuclear forces halt the collapse. There's a bounce. And that bounce shock, it stalls, but it leaves behind a, a profile that's um, uh, unstable to convection. And so they found that they, could, they, they, they would develop convection right above the proto-neutron star surface. And in 1994, Herontidol, uh did a calculation where they followed the star from collapse to bounce. That convection then was able to help drive an explosion, and they drove an explosion. So in 1994, they said, ah, this is not only, you know, may help us with explaining the asymmetries we see, but it also is showing us how do we take, get that potential energy that's released and be efficient at driving an explosion. Um, so this mechanism, uh, shortly there, about 10 years later, we were able to do the same calculations in 3D. So this is a plot of a uh, a figure of a three-dimensional explosion, a slice of a three-dimensional explosion, where the the colors are coding the entropy. So you see red is high entropy material that's rising bubbles, and the blue or purple material is low entropy material that's falling in in inflows. Um, and the arrows are detecting the velocity. So what this is is this is the in the very core of this neutron star. So it's the inner, or the, sorry, of this collapsing star. So it's the inner 300 kilometers. The blue center is this, this proto-neutron star that formed as we collapsed down, um, the iron core collapsed down to this neutron star and releases all this potential energy. The rest of the star is still falling in. So in the outer layers, you see this blue low entropy material falling in and it's falling in at nearly the uh, free fall velocity onto the, this proto-neutron star that has bounced and left behind this convective flow. And then you see the convection that's developing. Um, so we, we, in early 2000s, we had already started running three-dimensional calculations. In the last two decades, we have been doing increasingly sophisticated models with better neutrino transport, better um, uh, physics in the, uh, for the neutrino cross-sections, better equations of state, um, higher resolution, including magnetic fields. So people have been uh, studying this model, but we have come out with a, a kind of standard paradigm for what I would call normal supernova. Most normal supernova look to be produced by this kind of convective enhanced explosion where 
the material falls in, it collapses, it bounces, then convection starts to um, drive um, motion right above the photoneutron star. And what this does is it allows us to take, there's a lot of heat in this photoneutron star that's leaking out through neutrinos. It captures this energy and then converts it from this thermal energy to a kinetic energy of convection until we can blow off the star. And so this is kind of the model that everyone is studying. Um, they'll argue about the details, but uh, at this point, most groups are getting explosions with this full um, multidimensional model with neutrino physics put in. Um, what this model did was it helped us explain those red shifted lines. The explanation is that you went to very low mode convection and, um, and there's lots of different uh, kinds of convective instabilities you can get, but you, it, in all of these cases, if you can go to low mode convection, you can get a strong unimodal explosion that goes off in one direction. And what we believe happened with 1987A is the, we had a, a, a strong explosion and it went off in one direction. It's moving away at, from us. It's moving away at some angle from us and that causes the red shifted line. So here is a plot of a, a, an explosion where the red is the nickel. And so what happened was the explosion is going in a, one, one direction. And if you were looking toward it, you would see blue shifted lines. But if you're looking at some angle away from it, you can actually see red shifted lines. So we think that the explosion from 1987A was, they had a, a dominant mode that was moving away from us. And, and that, you know, that would explain that red, the red shifted lines we saw in both the gamma ray from the nickel decay and the iron lines. Um, but we went beyond just explaining existing observations. We started to make predictions for other observations. And one of them is, if this convective engine is right, you would expect the, the innermost material to be asymmetric and have um, uh, kind of bubbles of material moving out. And the only way to probe this is either looking at the nickel 56 or looking at titanium 44, elements that are produced deep down in that core. So you need to look at the, the elements that are produced in the core because the problem with looking at the outer material is that it's affected by the environment it's uh, blowing up into. So you don't know whether the explosion features you're seeing are coming from the uh, asymmetries in the star or the stellar winds, the circumstellar material, or the explosion itself. But if I look at the innermost ejecta, I'm actually looking at asymmetries in the explosion. And in the case of supernova remnants, this is how you would study it. And the new star satellite went and looked at the titanium 44 that was produced in the core of this Cassiopeia A supernova remnant. And it looked at what are, what's its distribution. And what, that's the scion material here. And you can see that it's producing um, kind of asymmetries in the explosion. And we attribute that to this convective engine. And they, you know, the New Star satellite went and they measured the, these are the decay lines, the, the gamma rays from, or hard x-rays from the decay lines of titanium 44. And they can look at different material and observe those decay lines. So they actually have a nice 3D map of what these asymmetries look like. So that's one uh, prediction of the model that then was confirmed by observations. Another prediction was that, um, that under this convective engine, it gets harder and harder to drive explosions as you increase the mass of the progenitor. And that's, that's only if mass loss isn't, if mass loss removes all the mass um, from the star, and we expect that for very high metallicities, then you can explode even a 50 solar mass star if it ends its life as a three solar mass star. But if mass loss um, keeps the core fairly compact, we expect it to be hard to drive explosions um, from uh, more and more massive star, stars. And in you know, 1999, we actually argued that above about 20, 25 solar masses, we wouldn't get very many explosions. And at the time, observations were saying the opposite. Observations were saying there were several observational papers looking at supernova lectures arguing that the masses of stars that exploded was above 20 solar mass. Um, and, and 1987A was a low mass progenitor because it was thought to be somewhere between 15 and 20 solar mass. Um, and so we were, you know, there was a problem with theory predicting that 
only stars below 20, 25 solar masses would explode and observations implying something different. Um, there was a lot of uncertainties in analyzing those observations. And so theory went on ignoring the observations. Um, but what happened in the end is more and more observations of supernova progenitors. Remember for 1987A, we actually saw the progenitor. Well, we've now seen the progenitors for quite a few. And this is uh, a result, a compilation by uh, Steve Smart in 2009 on the right, where he looked at the masses of the progenitors of um, supernova that where we have observations. And in all but one case, the mass is below 20 solar masses. And the, the one case where it is above 20 solar masses, it's, it's, that's an upper limit. So it could still be within that, you know, below 20 to 25 solar masses. And more data has come out since 2009, and they seem fairly consistent with this, which is most explosions occur below 20 to 25 solar masses, which you kind of expect with an IMF um, if above 20, 25 solar masses, you cannot, um, uh, you have trouble driving explosions. And that's what the theory predicted. So I think now the theory and the observations are, are uh, in line and they, they were kind of showing that, you know, this, this was a kind of a true prediction of the theory. So in 1999, when we made these predictions, the observers would come up and tell me I was wrong, right? So we, this is, the change happened over 10 years to show that, that this is a true theory prediction that um, uh, showed that our models may be right. Another way to constrain the models, and this is something that is more for the future, is general relativity and gravitational waves. The convection that we see in the engine produces distinct gravitational waves, and we can observe those and use those gravitational waves to constrain the, the, um, the convection in the, our model and prove that convection is true. And this is something that really gravitational waves will produce a very strong constraint on this convection, but it requires a nearby supernova. It requires a um, galactic supernova with, with uh, advanced LIGO. Um, or the hope is that uh, with next generation uh, telescopes, um, we can move out a little bit further and, and that will be a, uh, allow us to have a better chance of getting some nice gravitational wave signals to constrain our, um, our models. Um, but gravitational waves provide a really nice constraint of the engine for supernova. But this is not the only way gravitational waves uh, constrain supernova. They also constrain it by looking at the um, mass distribution of these compact remnants. And I think Pablo will talk about how well gravitational waves are doing at constraining um, the masses of compact remnants. And, it, you know, I can't stress enough how important it will be to get the masses from uh, both neutron stars and black holes from, you know, not just observations of the masses, but the distribution of masses from uh, gravitational waves. And I think that's something that's going to be an exciting field for the next, um, not just few years, but next couple decades as they get more and more precision measurements. But already uh, the masses that advanced LIGO has gotten has started to shape our, our theoretical models, has started to tell us something about the convective engine. Um, one thing that you have to be aware of is that LIGO has some, you know, there's, there's observational biases in all, every time you do observations, and LIGO is going to detect more massive black holes than it will the lower mass black holes, simply because it's more sensitive to them. Um, and so you have to correct for that when you create a mass distribution that you give theorists. Um, so, and, and the LIGO team does this. Um, it's been doing it for over a decade. They, you know, they, even before they had observations, they knew how to correct for it. I'm showing a paper by Chris Bolkinski in 2012 with Dan Holtz, where they actually looked at um, what would LIGO detect and what would, uh, um, what would advanced LIGO detect and um, how does that compare to the actual mass distribution? So, so it, you have to worry about the biases, but I, we know how to correct for them. And those mass distributions are really telling us something about the supernova explosion. Um, the kind of last observation evidence that I, I think uh, I would like to talk about um, before going into some uh, studies of the progenitors is the uh, nucleosynthetic yields. 
Um, in the engine of these uh, supernova, we are now predicting a range of electron fractions for the ejector mass. Um, I have a plot here on the right by Adam Burroughs et al., where he's studying the, um, he's doing these detailed neutrino transport models, and he's getting different electron fractions. And by studying the nucleosynthetic yields, we can actually constrain those electron fractions. And it not only teaches us something about the convective engine, I think in the end, it's going to teach us some neutrino physics, so some nuclear and neutrino physics. Um, it also, if you look at the detailed yields in this bottom plot or set of um, images from Sydney Andrews, where she's looking at changing the explosion energy of a, uh, I think this is a, um, I didn't write the star down. I think this is a 20 solar mass star, but she's looking at the yield of scandium 47 as a function of playing with the explosion energy and looking at where it's produced. And it's produced not just some, some of these uh, radioactive isotopes are not just produced in the core, but they're produced throughout the star. And we can use the production of these um, radioactive isotopes to actually constrain um, both the explosion energy and the progenitor structure. Um, I see that I'm running a little bit uh, low on time, so I want to go quickly through this. One of the other things that we're looking at is how do the yields change if you have asymmetric explosions? Because we saw that we do have asymmetric explosions. And so there's a lot of studies of the, um, the yields through asymmetric explosions. This is work done by Greg Vance, um, where he looked at how the outflows move. And the kind of simple models we did a decade ago, or some people are still doing, um, are probably not enough to really study the yields. And I think we're going to be doing better and better models to, to study the detailed yields and compare them to observations. Um, in the last few minutes, I wanted to talk about one other probe that we have um, for supernova that people are proposing, which is to look at the emergence, the early time emergence of um, X-rays and UV from supernova when the shock just breaks out of the star. Um, so we have asymmetries in the, uh, in the explosion, we have asymmetries in the star, we have asymmetries in the circumstellar media, and all of those produce shocks that will appear when the, the shock just breaks out of the star and starts moving through the circumstellar medium. And there's a couple satellites that are being, uh, being proposed that should be launched soon. Ultrasat is one of them. Um, there's a a bigger mission called Cybex being proposed that will observe the shock interactions of these asymmetry, of the, as the shock goes through this asymmetric ma matter to try to constrain, um, uh, w you know, what's, what's really the asymmetries in these, in these stars. And what's, what I really like about this kind of study is it ties together laboratory experiments. So there's laboratory experiments trying to study shock progress through um, stochastic media. So on this left panel is a simulation of an experiment being designed at Los Alamos National Lab to study shocks to a stochastic media. Um, uh, and, and the size scale from this is at, actually at the level of 0.1 centimeters. So I have something that's a simulation of something that's at the size scale of 0.1 centimeter. It's being run at the uh, uh, Omega facility in Rochester where they use lasers to drive a strong shock through something. Um, but the upper right uh, middle panel is a, the same kind of shocks running through the circumstellar medium where we have asymmetries, a kind of stochastic medium in, a, uh, in, in the circumstellar medium shock progressing through it. And it's the same physics. So we're actually calibrating and understanding that physics on laboratory experiments. And then we can apply it to supernova to go all the way to building a, an X-ray telescope. And um, I guess with that, I will end the talk. Um, I, the, the point of my talk was to say, look, asymmetries, the, the in, asymmetries we observed in 1987A kind of gave us a really, you know, drove us to the model that we now believe behind core collapse supernova. And since that time, since 1987, we both have developed the models that explain what happened with 1987 but now allow us to do comparisons to other data and make predictions, things like what's the, you know, looking at supernova remnants and the uh, titanium-44 distribution, things like the remnant masses. And, and we're, we're planning observations for things like gamma rays. So there's a, a whole set of gamma ray telescopes being proposed 
to try to study the nuclear synthesis better. Gravitational waves are going to bring a lot more observations to constrain this model as we get both from the potential to see gravitational waves and neutrinos from a, a nearby object all the way to going looking at the compact remnants, um, which I think will really place the distribution of compact remnant masses and spins will really um, place some nice constraints on the engine. And finally, this last thing that I, we, I, I spoke about, which is shock emergence. This early shock emergence is another way to probe the asymmetries in stars. And with that, I'll end my talk. And thank you for your time. We have a, a problem because uh, um, Lorimer did not show up and uh, therefore we have uh, no chairman at the moment. And um, the only thing we can do is to see if there are questions and, uh, and remark. Uh, can you see from uh, Gregory, can you see if there are questions from the... Yes. Please. Yeah, so I, I, I... You can answer, I, yes, please. Yes. yes. May, may, may I? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. May, may I? Oh, okay. Uh, hi, Chris. Um, thank you for the nice talk. Um, let, let me uh, go back to the to the result of SMART, um, as you mentioned. So there's the range of masses, um, uh, that are the masses of the pre-supernova pre masses, right? Um, but uh, these, um, these numbers come from the archive, if I understand correctly. From the from archival data, but you can also derive those masses from the supernova model of the I mean from modeling the light curves. So when you model the light curves, these two masses coincide. So in passing, so you is, are. Yeah, that Jorge, this is a great question. So this is why when we initially predicted that the masses had to be low, you know, so the theory models were saying that the engine modelers said that the masses had to be low. But the light curve modelers were saying the masses had to be high. And so the, the problem with modeling supernova light curves, and we've gotten better since, since the uh, uh, late 90s and early 1000s, um, the, the problem was that if you don't get the opacities exactly right, if you know, any kind of uncertainties in the models, and you can fit, uh, you, know, you can get the wrong fit. And so we, you know, we're getting better and better at trying to be more careful with our models, but we, you know, light curve modeling is very difficult. So it's, it's harder to infer the mass in the ejecta from the light curve models than it is by just looking at these HST archives and, and getting the progenitors. Um, so they don't always agree. And, and it's partially telling us we have to work harder on our models. And I'll give an example of my team. We, we had gotten a, a very interesting supernova and we thought we could only fit it with a parent stable supernova. And we were, so we were convinced we'd seen a parent stable supernova um, and, and we fit the model, we could fit the data. And then Dan Kaysen came up with a, a fit where it was a lower mass progenitor, but he just had some shell interactions. And so he's able to explain the same data with a model that was you know, one tenth the mass that we were uh, claiming we needed, or maybe one fifth the mass that we claimed we needed. And all it was is he he changed, he, he put in some uh, circumstellar media that the supernova shock was hitting, and that made all the difference. And in the end, I think Dan's model was probably the better model. And it was just, you know, we we found a fit. We said we were good and we didn't think, oh, what, what happens if I play with the circumstellar media? So things like opacity, circumstellar media um, effects uh, can really make it hard sometimes to infer a mass from the light curves. And so there's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard job. So it, it, they don't always get the same answer, but I will say that the masses from this archival data looking at the progenitors is usually the more reliable one. Uh -huh. This is what I thought. Thank you, thank you for the detailed answer. I see there's a question on the Q&A. Should I read it out? Um, I have a question, I'm Valerio Bozza, and uh, my question is about uh, the relations between the asymmetry in the, um, <clears throat> in the explosion and the rotational and magnetic properties of the progenitors. 
Uh, is it possible to find any correlations between the observed asymmetries, what we know about asymmetries in supernovae, and the, the distributions of uh, rotational periods or magnetic fields of uh, massive stars? So it would be interesting to find the correlations between uh, these things in order to understand the, the origin of the asymmetries. Yeah, and one of the games that we've tried to do for that is you look at uh, the kicks in um, in supernova and you ask the question, you can see the, in some of these, you can see the kick and you can look at the rotation of the pulsar. So you have a pulsar with some kick and you can ask the question, uh, how is that rotation and the kick, are they aligned? What are, what are you seeing there? And the evidence is not as uh, ideal as, as, so there's some that look like they're well aligned and so the kick is aligned with the rotation axis. So you can imagine if you have strong rotation, even without magnetic fields, if you have strong rotation, that's going to uh, limit the convection to the uh, uh, rotation axis, and you'll get a stronger explosion just along that axis. Um, if you add magnetic fields to that, um, and I, I think you know the the importance of magnetic fields. I think there there probably there's a subset of supernova where magnetic fields are playing a driving role in the explosion, um, but I think for a lot of supernova it's not. So I, I don't think magnetic fields. Um, were that important in, say, Cassiopeia A remnant, um, uh, the, the data doesn't uh, match that. But I, I think you could have mag magnetic fields be important. But the alignment between kicks and, and which would you, you think is the direction of the explosion and rotation doesn't seem to be always true. Um, it's true in several cases, but it's not always true. Um, we, you know, you would, uh, you would have to do, um, I think the, the jury is still out on that. I mean, we, I think we need more data to see uh, how many supernova are well aligned, well aligned with that rotation axis versus, versus not. And there's just, we need more data. Um, yeah, Jan Novak, please, a short answer and show a short question, short answer, please. Um, yes, we, we, well, okay. Yes and no, people have included, uh, uh, approximations for the this uh, Jorge re, uh, asked a question: Are you including neutrino flavor con conversion oscillation in the calculations? The answer is yes and no. People have put it in um, in some of their models as a kind of a but in a toy way. So we're not doing detailed neutrino flavor conversion uh, calculations, but we have things where we change the heating to see how it affects it, and that can be an important effect. Um, it's just really hard to include it in a first principles way. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, the people that, it, there's been a lot of studies where you look at a, a, a simple profile and ask how important can neutrino flavor uh, oscillations be? Um, and there's also been uh, some people that have instead just put in a toy. If, the, if they have that kind of importance, I'll add this extra energy deposition, but that's about the level that it's been added. And Novak has a, uh, has a question. Please formulate the question. There is apparently an audio problem. So we can uh, maybe go on with the next speaker. Okay. Chris, we will have to continue this discussion in the next days. I look okay. forward to it. Okay, so uh, we can ask uh, our next speaker, who is Pablo Laguna, to share his screen. Can you see it? Oh, yes, yes, we can see. The stage is lost, okay. please. Um, how about now? Yes, we can see it. Okay, all right. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Remo and the organizing committee for the invitation. And uh, I'm delighted to spend the next 30 minutes telling you about numerical relativity, uh, a little bit about uh, uh, where we are with the simulations, and also the role that those simulations have played in the interpretation of gravitational wave observations. Um, I'm at uh, the University of Texas, and we just re recently established the Center for Gravitational Physics, and we hope to organize a in-person conference this coming year, and you will hear the announcement. All right, let me just start with uh, uh, kind of the flashy way to present the numerical relativity simulations. What you have here 
is in the upper left um, is the simulations of a binary black hole. This is as close as you can get, uh, given the parameters that were published to the event uh, in 1905-21. In the upper right is the first detection of a double neutron star merger. And, um, and at the bottom is the one that we just hear um, uh, from the collaboration last week. That is the, the two events that involve uh, the merger of a black hole and a uh, uh, neutron star. So I'll just play the simulations. These are uh, uh, simulations done by our group. And uh, what you see at the bottom and the two of them is uh, the gravitational wave produced by the event. And in the one with the double neutron star, you have two panels in the left, you have the uh, density profiles. And then the right hand side, you have just uh, contour plots or of the gravitational waves. Uh, this is great. I mean, this is a way that one uses to mostly uh, advertise or do press releases, but uh, let's move on to what, uh, how these simulations are actually used in, um, in connection with data uh, uh, analysis. This is the figure number one that is quite famous by right now of the first detection of gravitational waves. And if you look at the, at the second from the top or row, you see the word numerical relativity there. You see it there in that the red line on the left superimposed with, uh, with uh, uh, reconstructed signal and in blue on the, on the right. So uh, it is clear that uh, uh, there is some uh, input, there is some guidance that these numerical relativity simulations have played in determining the uh, characteristics of the, of the binary. And that is what I want to spend uh, most of the time. So uh, next is, uh, let me just start by uh, giving you a sense of what is the different components in this. Uh, I'm gonna concentrate for the moment in, in binary black holes, but also, of course, it applies uh, to some extent uh, in the, with the double neutron star and the mixed binary. So what you have here is that uh, there are basically three stages. There is the early spiral in which uh, here you cannot, you can perhaps use uh, post-Newtonian methods to some extent, but in the span that I, in, in this figure is mostly numerical relativity. That is, you have about uh, 10, or eight uh, orbits before merger. And that is the typical span, and maybe a little bit more, I've, I've been too pessimistic, uh, is between 10 or 20 uh, cycles that uh, most of the numerical relativities can cover without uh, being too expensive. The simulations continue to be very expensive, and I will spend uh, the second half of my talk talking about what is the future of numerical relativity to address this. So you have, a, you know, in this figure, you had about, you know, eight uh, cycles or so. At some point in the late spiral, that is when you see that, uh, that the horizons have the largest deformation eventually. Uh, just about a uh, few M before you reach peak magnitude, that is when the merger occurs. And in this case, for the binary black holes, we call it the merger when the first time that you detect the or the appearance of an apparent horizon that uh, encapsulates the original two apparent horizons and the end you had the ring down in my opinion uh, the next big frontier so to speak in uh, that we're going to see in this area will be precisely in the ring down i mean the detectors are going to be very sensitive to the point in which the signal to noise ratio in this part is going to allow us to uh, investigate in exquisite detail what happens during the ring down. And even that you can treat this with uh, perturbation theory, but uh, in order to get the whole history of the whole, uh, yeah, the whole history of the process, we need numerical relativity simulations that are capable to be accurate enough to uh, assist in the data analysis of that. So this is in, in terms of uh, how the uh, a binary black hole, the anatomy of a binary black hole, but let's just put it in context of what is what numerical relativity covers. And this picture has been uh, 
it's become more uh, like a requirement in any of the, in every of these talks just to put in context where numerical relativity plays a big role so in this plot having the horizontal direction the mass ratio of the binary and in the vertical direction a measure of the compactness okay so numerical relativity uh, right now the parameter space that we're able to cover is at, at this range you know in which you have a mass ratios of uh, pro, I mean, comfortably, you can probably go to uh, uh, 1 to 20, 1 to 40. There have been uh, heroic runs that go to 100, but I think in terms of production that assists data analysis, it's safe to say that is, uh, you know, 1 to 20 uh, and so on. And the same thing goes with compactness. Now, you have the other two approaches, the one that is uh, the gravitational self-force in which you have... Uh, 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 a test particle, so to speak, uh, in the presence of a, of a massive uh, black hole. And uh, you can do that with perturbative methods. The other end of the spectrum is in which you have uh, the, the two objects that are separated enough and moving at speeds not comparable to the speed of light in which you can uh, apply post-Newtonian theory. So notice here that there is a gap. This is not very precise, but there's still room here to be able to numerical relativity to go get closer or gain more um, uh, real estate in that direction. All right, so today numerical relativity can do the following. Uh, this is just uh, in one slide, trying to give you a sense of uh, where we are. Notice, that uh, this is uh, more than uh, you know, 15 years since the first time that uh, two black holes were coll uh, collided. And that was by Franz Pretorius using the generalized harmonic formulation. And uh, the following year, two independent groups, one that was at that point in uh, University of Texas at Brownsville and the other one at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. They uh, were able to do a, another collision using a different type of formulation. In this case was the BSSM formulation and uh, introduced what is called the moving punctures method. That is a combination of uh, how you um, apply the gauge conditions or the coordinate conditions. But these days we have several codes. This is, a, I have another slide with a more comprehensive list of that. I'm just listing here a few. There is the Einstein toolkit. This is our code that is uh, based on the Einstein toolkit. It just has some minor differences. Uh, the group on RIT has uh, another one, a spec, uh, is, uh, that is used uh, uh, based in generalized harmonic coordinates. So there are, there are many codes. Again, there are also different formulations, BCS, Zen, Z4, generalized, and different uh, gauges associated with it. The typical approaches is in one case, you go and excise the singularity. That is, you remove from the computational domain a region in which you believe the black singularity is present. The other one is the puncture approach. And that one, uh, uh, it's a little bit from the computational view, in my opinion, it's, it's not as challenging. You don't have to do any anything with the computational domain the gauge takes care of things by itself. Now, in terms of the data analysis, or in terms of uh, uh, how numerical relativity is helping uh, the effort in analyzing data collected by interferometers, uh, is by building catalogs. And those catalogs are used typically for two types of uh, uh, efforts. One of them, the waveforms in the catalogs are used to calibrate these um, models of uh, templates. And they are typically two main ones. Uh, you know, there are phenomenological templates and there is a, a EOB templates. And most recently we had these uh, surrogate models that they use the, these things. So those catalogs are uh, very helpful in that. And we hope that the more and more uh, uh, people uh, doing numerical relativity will, will uh, help in building these catalogs. Most of them are for binary black holes, but uh, pretty soon we're going to be having uh, 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 for, all, for the neutron stars uh, uh, in, in binary systems. And again, there is also interest that these codes are used to use GR calculations. Some of them have been used to uh, do alternative theories of gravity. So here is a very quickly a uh, list of the codes that is more comprehensive. Some of them are open source. 
Some of them directly contribute to wafer catalogs. Here are the, the formulations that I was mentioning here. They basically are BSSN or BSSN-like type of uh, formulations and, and the generalized harmonic uh, conditions. And some of them include hydro. And as I say, there is now an effort to go beyond numerical relativity. So one thing that uh, it is important, given the different codes, the different formulations and so on, is to do comparisons. That will help us to add confidence that uh, the predictions that we make uh, are robust. Uh, before the first detection, there were attempts of just doing comparison. There were studies doing comparisons, direct comparison uh, among the groups. There was the first one, the Ninja, the NRAR, and so on. And after that, uh, there were uh, comparisons that were doing uh, mostly to compare numerical relativity with gravitational waves to do parameter estimation and so on. Now, the, the challenge with this is uh, there are several, there are several uh, aspects that are very challenging. Some of them, for instance, still is not clear if we have a, a good definition of eccentricity. Uh, comparing simulations involving uh, precessing spin is very difficult, even just at the point of starting the, I mean, uh, deciding about initial data with all these different codes, different gauges, and so on. Uh, John radiation, that is that, uh, that very spurious radiation that you get uh, because the initial data is imperfect, that could be a problem, especially for highly spinning black holes. And as I mentioned, one of the things, given the different flavors of codes and so on, it also, um, uh, we had to pay attention about uh, when we set these comparisons about the initial data. Uh, all right, so the after the, you know, the detections then, not only the numerical relativity simulations were used to, to be able to calibrate or to improve the, the waveform models, but they also were used uh, targeted to specific events. And here is just a, not a comprehensive list, but I'm going to just put in some of them, in which uh, they were numerical relativity play a key role in these follow up studies after the event. In particular, the figure here on, on the bottom right is from the Haley et al. paper in which uh, you know, we did uh, uh, comparisons of uh, basically three groups, the, the SXX, the one in RIT, and at that time uh, we were at uh, Georgia Tech. And uh, the idea is to be able to see uh, not only how well each of the numerical relativity simulations uh, uh, perform, but also in context with what a specific event. Okay. Now, the open challenges in this type of uh, in this type of work is: uh, can we just do it uh, automatic? That is, can you have a trigger event and then just be able to do all the simulations uh, that are needed? Okay. So for the future, okay, what we need is uh, we're going to have uh, future ground and space detectors that are more sensitive and even LIGO, of course, that, that is a part of it. There is potential for very large SNR signal to noise ratios, especially with LISA. So what we want to know is uh, about uh, the errors. I mean, how well a numerical relativity will perform on that. And uh, let me just show you a result uh, from a recent paper from our group. So this is uh, uh, making an estimate of what will happen and if you have, for instance, here on the left, you have a, a, a binary with mass ratio of six, one to six in both cases. And uh, what we do is we go and subtract, okay, the two different resolutions, one from the other one, and to see if the residuals are below the noise curve of a given detector. And you can see here in the left that this light blue line is the residual after subtracting a high from a low resolution template. So that is worrisome in, uh, uh, and, and the SNR here for Lisa was 976, uh, for the Einstein telescope 630 and for LIGO, advanced LIGO 60. So it's worrisome because uh, you can see here that the leaf, the, the, uh, you can see here that in the Lisa and the Einstein telescope, 
the residuals are above the noise uh, curve. So that means that uh, if you want to subtract the signal, uh, it, could be, it, could, it could give you a false impression that there is a signal present there and it's just uh, a result of the uh, 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 numerical errors. Uh, let me skip this over the, uh, because I'm running out of time. Uh, so here is uh, from the uh, simulation from, uh, and that's why I think a numerical relativity will be able to play a big role as more um, uh, mixed binary uh, events take place. This is a, a black hole neutron star merger. The mass ratio is two. The black hole is two, two times the mass of the neutron star. And here are some snapshots of the merger. And contrary to what happened with the merger that we announced uh, a week ago, here, the disruption of the neutron star happens earlier. So you're able to see that there is a, a hint of a, an accretion disk, so to speak. Now that has the consequence that uh, as the black hole relaxes, that is as you get the ring down of the black hole, there is still matter around that is accreted. So here in the right-hand side, I have a plot of uh, what, if we had a binary black hole would be the ring down of the final black hole here it's clear that you don't get that. And the reason, the main reason for that is because you still have matter accreted into the system. All right. So the challenges, as I said, that we have solved things for mass ratios of 15 or less. There are uh, spins, moderate spins. We also have tens of orbits and so on. I think what we need to go is, that, first of all, we need to increase the accuracy of the simulations. We need to have more cycles. We need to have a better measure of what we mean by accuracy related in, with respect to uh, uh, data analysis. All right, in the last few minutes of the talk, I sent an email to my colleagues in the community, asked them if uh, they wanted me to advertise or to give an update of their efforts for what is coming next in numerical relativity. So here are just a few examples that I received. So this one is for David uh, Nielsen and collaborator Eric Hirschman. I'm very excited about this project. This is uh, one of the things that uh, we have struggled with, at least with our current code in the Einstein toolkit, is uh, uh, adaptivity, adaptive measure finding. And I think the approach that uh, David uh, and Eric and collaborators following is very promising. Here is just a snapshot of how that uh, 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 adaptivity will work. And this will be very, very helpful uh, for binary system with large mass ratios. So in that gap of that plot that I was showing, I think it will, it will able to get it closer to the self four side of things. Here is another example. This is also uh, uh, that I think has great promise. This is by Zachary Etienne, and now at the University of Idaho, is Black Holes at Home. And uh, here again, he paid very careful attention that uh, the activity is a, a problem. And what he had uh, tackled that with uh, is by doing uh, a very clever way of uh, combining spherical coordinates in uh, multi patches and so on. So he is able to get uh, uh, very efficient structure, even for mass ratios of uh, one to six and so on. And the performance is great. Still, it's on the work. The plot here on the right are comparisons with, uh, with uh, the Einstein toolkit. But I think uh, this is uh, something that, uh, in my opinion, once that it, he plans to do to be open source, we, the community will benefit tremendously. Um, uh, Bruno Giacomasso and collaborators sent me this. They are working with the Spritz code. That is a general relativistic MHD code with neutrinos. It is publicly available. This is based on the Einstein toolkit. And uh, in order to handle the, the MHD, they do the vector formulation and it supports several. This is going into the direction of added more physics to the, to, to the codes to be able to deliver that. And uh, the next, uh, the next, the next one, uh, oh, this is uh, the, the same group, but this is uh, more detail about how to go from uh, conservative variables to primary variables. All right, so there is another code that uh, this was provided to me by Veruzni, uh, Veruzni and, uh, and uh, this is a GR Athena++ code. And again, here working on the AMR side, so this is the third time that I repeat AMR, I think that is a big, uh, 
uh, effort in numerical relativity that it will allow us to go to the next level. And uh, they use it the Z4 formulation. And uh, again, performance uh, is, is looking very promising. In this case, here's an example of a waveform compared with uh, other uh, methods. Uh, 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 Luciano Resola, he has been working on uh, this discontinuous Galeric method to do the GRMHD. Here, here on the left uh, are uh, here are two uh, in the left a snapshot of a test uh, doing a blast wave, and in the right hand side he is, uh, is a complementary work that uses uh, the, is aimed at the relativistic lattice, uh, lattice Boltzmann equation. All right, and uh, one as you when I was talking about um, Zachary Thien's work, I mean you saw that is is uh, spherical type coordinates. The, I think the, the ones that started this, uh, the first paper was by David Brown, but I think uh, my, my friend uh, Thomas uh, Baumher has been pushing this. And these are two examples that, uh, of calculations that he has done that now this approach to spherical por uh, polar coordinates and implemented in the big codes. One of them was in the revisiting the, the Chopwick uh, uh, critical collapse. And in the right hand side was about a neutron star inside of a small black hole. All right, so uh, I think that uh, gravitational waves and multidimensional astronomy are here. That's not a, uh, nothing new. But what I want to emphasize is the future ground detectors and space detectors will, uh, because of their sensitivity, because of the ability to detect signals at very high SNR, Will put uh, uh, will make that uh, numerical relativity will need to work harder on the one hand, but it will be able to provide uh, means to predict and interpret gravitational waves. There is many many work uh, ahead to be done, and uh, but I will stop there and take some questions. Thank you. Well, Pablo, a very beautiful talk and uh, very, uh, extremely interesting. Uh, but let me express some concern. You have shown this uh, classic result of 1509-14, um, which was detected the first week of uh, entering to function, uh, still uh, not yet uh, operative of the LIGO detectors. And um, the data, these data were superb quality. And it was possible to work on them. And in fact, with Rodriguez, we did precisely what you are planning to do, to look uh, at the at the ringing modes, and we found some uh, conceptual difficulties in the, in the result of, of the ringing modes. And we published that, and I will send you the paper. But what worries me, that in the six years since, there has not been a single signal of clarity and, uh, uh, and uh, possibility to work in such a detail since apart, of course, 1708, 17A, which needs a different problematic that we don't look at the ringing modes that you are mentioning. Therefore, I feel just my concern. And, um, and, uh, and um, this is my point. And, uh, and also the difficulty we are encountering in 1708, 17, is very important. Therefore, yes, oh, uh, let's see if we go on and we find some good examples. Six years is a long time compared to the first week of operation. And um, I live just with that, with my concern. Uh, right. I, I mean, I, I, I share your concern, but I mean, I think it's, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the main issue is the uh, how the SNR accumulates during the ring down. I mean, the, if the SNR is, is high enough, and if, it's my understanding that uh, we have not seen an event in which uh, 
we get uh, yet the sensitivity from the detectors to have a clear uh, 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 ring down, at least even, I mean, the hope is that we see more than one mode and uh, to be able to do more interesting things. But that, I, that is just a matter of time as, uh, as the detectors improve, so. I will send to you and to everyone everybody our paper of Rodriguez because the result as they publish they are not consistent in our opinion with the fundamental physics like they were not consistent consistent in fundamental physics the result of Misner but uh, anyway this is in the literature and I will send to you thanks I think Chris has a question yeah, there is a question for Chris please yes uh, Pablo so that this is where I'm starting to get really excited about gravitational waves because it looks like the numerical simulations are getting higher and higher fidelity. And, you know, there's already been some studies on neutron stars looking at the neutron star equation of state. Um, but I, I can envision that you can not you can do even constraints on if there's strong magnetic fields in these neutron stars, will that also uh, affect if you had these merging neutron stars with strong magnetic fields? Will you be able to probe the magnetic field properties as well? It, and, and when I say, will you be able to do it? I'm thinking in an era where we have next generation telescopes and a nearby event. Um, is this what some of the science will be able to do? Will the theory be able to be ready for it when these new detectors get out there? I, I think so. I mean, uh, as I, in some of the examples that I gave there, is uh, people are really work. I mean, I think they're working in two fronts uh, and some groups do it at the same time. One of them is more into the uh, software engineers, so to speak, okay, and trying to improve the AMR, trying to improve uh, uh, efficiency of the codes and, and, and so on. The other one is into adding the physics or the microphysics or magnetic fields and, and, and so on. Or, uh, and I think that uh, uh, both, both avenues are making great progress. Uh, now, the, the question is, uh, are, are we gonna be, uh, for instance, with, with regard to LISA, are we gonna be ready uh, when, when uh, we start getting that there? I, I believe we will, okay? And uh, now in terms of the physics content, uh, that one I don't know. I mean, that, that is, as, as you were just mentioning with your simulations, that it's you know it's a it's a more painful process I think when you started to add all these uh, uh, very complex uh, 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 you know microphysics or multiphysics. But I, I think the future is looking good in my opinion. I think we have another question. Yeah, from Bean, please Bean. Thanks, Pablo, for the nice talk. Yeah, so my question is for neutron star mergers. Um, so we now know that there are simulations up to uh, forming the uh, black hole maybe through a hypermassive neutron star phase briefly. But from the, um, say, GRB observations, there seems to be evidence that after new neutron star mergers, you might probably produce a much long-lived neutron star to a supermassive phase or even stable phase. And there must be also secular gravitational waves released during that period of time. So is there any um, efforts trying to simulate this uh, phase? I know it's a long shot to observe the gravitational waves, but it, it, is it going on to simulate the uh, gravitational wave waveforms? I think that that is a great example of uh, in which one can go and, you know, you work in the binary maybe with these coordinates that Zach Athean is talking about, but at the end, if you can switch to these uh, spherical like coordinates that uh, I uh, briefly mentioned that have been pioneered by Baumhart, I think then the codes can be more efficient because it's uh, the geometry, it's, uh, it's, a, it's more in, in tune with the physics that is happening there. I mean, I'm talking about the geometry or, or the, the, the coordinate system in there. And I think that then we'll be able to do a much longer simulations. The same thing, for instance, in, in another context, uh, uh, right now, the, uh, the 3D 
numerical relativity simulations that, for instance, in some of the groups, including mine, we're doing for rapidly not rotating neutron star. If you do it in Cartesian type coordinates, you're you are you you are very limited, okay, and to do the long term. But with these coordinates that are tailored to what uh, the the problem looks like, I mean, in this case, more uh, spherical looking. I think that is where we can extend the life of the simulations to be able to address maybe that uh, uh, regime that you're talking about. But the there certainly the the merging of the two neutron star is a field in which there is a clear signal of uh, jet radiation. And therefore, this will be the ideal case to tune to the detail of the jet radiation, the models, and see if there is a coincidence with the gravitational wave. But definitely, that is a very promising direction to gain from the uh, analysis done the details of the jet radiation, which must be coming out of the binary neutron star emerging. We have beautiful examples, 09, 05, 10, many, and, and five or six of them. Thank you. Probably we can move on with the program. Uh, if there are no more questions. Uh, the next speaker is Victoria Caspi, who just joined us. Please, Victoria, can you show, share your screen, please? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and we can see the slides. We can see you. Okay, wonderful. Um, so, okay, yeah, thank you uh, very much. And I just want to thank the uh, organizers for this. Uh, you know, the, the Marcel Gross Mini Meeting is always uh, such a wonderful conference, and, and it still is, even under these less than ideal circumstances. I'm, I've been really enjoying it. So, thank you to the organizers for all the hard work they've they've put in and I'm here to tell you today about observations of uh, fast radio bursts. So uh, what are fast radio bursts? These are bursts of radio waves that last just a few milliseconds. They're highly dispersed. That is they um, suffer cold plasma dispersion as we see ubiquitously for galactic radio pulsars. You can see an example, the, the famous example of the very first discovered fast radio bursts by Lorimer et al. here. Um, you see uh, time on the x-axis where this is just a few hundred milliseconds and on the y-axis is radio frequency. And you can see uh, the, the horizontal line is just some terrestrial interference, but uh, the signal is this sweep that, that comes through, which is uh, the dispersed radio waves, which when de-dispersed produces the inset plot where we see nothing but radiometer noise before the event then the burst and then nothing subsequently. Uh, we know that this phenomenon is ubiquitous. It's not, it's not something rare in that the all, all sky rates, roughly speaking, is about a thousand events across the whole sky every day. Uh, and they're approximately isotropically distributed, but all of, all of these statements I'm going to make a little more precise later in the talk. Um, the dispersion, the degree of dispersion, as I'm about to explain uh, in more detail, is consistent with these objects coming certainly from well outside the Milky Way and uh, cosmological, in fact, cosmological distances, which of course implies very large energies. Um, the range is quite wide for fast radio bursts, anywhere between 10 to the 35 and 10 to the 43 uh, ergs for the population observed thus far. And for reviews, you can um, see a couple uh, great reviews by Emily Petroff and collaborators and um, uh, Jim Cortez and Shami Chatterjee. So the dispersion, um, the F fast, fast radio burst source we think produces all radio waves uh, here depicted with colors <laughs> uh, at the same time. So the burst happens, we think at the source at the same time and all of the dispersion is due to intervening plasma, the cold, uh, uh, the cold plasma, the free electrons basically disperse them so that the high frequencies arrive below the low, the, 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 below the, um, sorry, the, um, oh my goodness, so sorry about that. Below, uh, the high frequencies arrive uh, before the low frequencies. And we can model this dispersion 
using a model for uh, the galaxy, which if you could view it, uh, you're seeing it here from above. And here would be what the distribution in the galactic plane looks like of free electrons. You see spiral arms there, it's galactic center. And you can also plot it as a contour plot as was done by Cortes and Lazio back in 2002. Um, where the little Pac-Man here is Earth, and here's the galactic center, you see spiral arms. And these are contours of constant total column depth of free electrons, which we refer to as the dispersion measure. It's the integrated electron density along, along the line of sight. This model for the free electrons in the galaxy is a three-dimensional model. This is just a slice through it. Uh, but in any direction, if you observe some sort of transient radio burst, be it a, a pulse from a galactic pulsar or an FRB, um, you, from the dispersion measure, you can infer a distance. And in particular, the models for free electrons, they eventually run out of free electrons in the Milky Way galaxy. So for any direction on the sky, there is a maximum number of free electrons that we believe the Milky Way can have. And this is how we infer the extragalactic distances of fast radio bursts, because for the Lorimer burst, uh, from this, you know, the slope of the parabolic trend um, in, in this uh, uh, dispersed plot, uh, we know that the dispersion measure of this burst was about 375 in our, in our DM units. Whereas the maximum inferred from models of the galaxy is just 25. So there's way more free electrons than you can account for in the Milky Way galaxy. There's, and there's no foregrounds there. There's, this, this was studied very carefully. There's, there's no object in the front, like a dense H2 region in the direction of the source. Um, basically, it implies that, that this source had to be way outside the galaxy and must be extremely bright, therefore. Now, when we say cosmological distance, how do we infer that? Typical models of the IGM, which will soon be refined by fast radio bursts, suggest, of course, there should be a very ionized component uh, in the intergalactic medium, uh, and that the dispersion measure in the IGM should be, roughly speaking, 1,200 times the redshift. That's very rough, of course. Uh, but if you apply that to that Lorimer burst, you get a redshift of 0.3 or a distance of a gigaparsec. So that's why we infer cosmological distances. But we know, of course, that's likely just an upper limit because FRB must come from some host galaxy, which itself has some interstellar medium and some DM components. So the total DM, which is the only thing we can measure, is equal to the DM from the Milky Way, ISM, interstellar medium, perhaps some halo in the Milky Way. Perhaps galaxies have halos of free electrons. We think they do. The IGM component and any host component. Um, and so let's say you were to split, you know, we, we know the, IG, we know the Milky Way components. We can, we have good estimates of them anyway. If you subtract that off the Lorimer burst dispersion measure and then divide it equally among the, between the IGM and the host. Okay. So that's still 500 megaparsecs, roughly speaking. So it's still a lot of energy in these bursts. Um, so basically what are models, what have models been suggested, I'm going to say this very briefly because the talk after mine is by Bing Zhang, where he's going to delve into models in much more detail. But just to set the stage, first of all, for several years, there were more models than there were events. Uh, that's certainly no longer true, as I'll describe. But in any case, we know from just the brevity, the few millisecond durations of FRBs that the source size uh, from light travel, art, travel time arguments has to be you know, very compact. So we're talking about some sort of compact object you know, neutron star comes to mind. Um, but the energy here, the energies involved, I mentioned they're very large, but they're not very, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not revolutionary types of energies. Gamma ray bursts have isotropic energies 10 to the 53 or you know, many orders of magnitude greater than those in FRBs. On the other hand, we know from the brightness temperatures of these objects, uh, you know, they have silly, silly, uh, enormously high brightness temperatures, similar to we've observed in radio pulsar. So, you know, something about the radio emission mechanism, it has to be coherent. That suggests strong magnetic fields, perhaps. Um, now, in terms, just from energetics, there's easily enough energy in cataclysmic events. And, and for a long time, that's, you know, people thought that, that all FRBs might be related to cataclysmic events, perhaps supernovae. 
but there was always a problem. Oh, the opacities in supernovae at the start are quite high, it might be difficult to get radio waves out of there. And for compact object mergers that like we've just been hearing about, the rate, uh, you know, it's a, not a thousand per sky per day. And that thousand per sky per day is just above some flat flux threshold that's, you know, for current technology. Um, you know, that seems, that seems, the rate seems off. Um, you, you're, then one looks to isolated neutron stars. Um, we know the crab pulsar we've known for years has giant radio pulses that are quite luminous, but still nowhere near as luminous as FRBs, and orders of magnitude, both in energy and luminosity, too low. Another option that's been discussed a lot, and I believe is currently the favored model, at least for some FRBs, are magnetars, that is, extremely highly magnetized neutron stars, the highest magnetic field objects we know of in the universe, there's certainly enough magnetic energy in those objects to somehow power FRBs. Exactly how that happens is something Bing Zhang is going to try and help you with later. So there is a, um, a great FRB theory wiki that you, you're welcome to look at. And also I suggest you stick around for Bing Zhang's talk if you wanna know more about models. Now, one hugely constraining observation of FRBs is that some of them repeat. So Lorimer burst we've never seen again, uh, but uh, uh, this, this particular uh, source, uh, at 12, FRB 121102, uh, discovered with the Arecibo uh, telescope that of course is no longer around with us. Um, this was the first FRB found to repeat. And here you can see de-dispersed repeat bursts from the same position on the sky at the same dispersion measure. And this immediately with a single observation ruled out cataclysmic models, at least for this source. There were 10 of these bursts in an hour uh, after several months before the first burst. And since that time, uh, there's been all sorts of beautiful observations, including by the FAST telescope, uh, thousand, over a thousand bursts from the source have been seen since its discovery. And you can see the bursts come in all sorts of interesting lumen, diff different brightnesses. You see a really bright one here, different spectra. You know, the spectrum here, th th these are now the radio frequency always on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. You see a, the spectrum's rising to lower frequency here, the spectrum's ri rising to higher frequency. A whole variety of morphologies, which itself is curious. Um, but one of the most interesting questions that it raises is do they all repeat? So men, most FRBs we have not seen to repeat, but perhaps we just haven't waited long enough. Now FRB, in terms of burst morphologies, most FRBs show single peaked pulses, a single pulse that is broadband in fact, like the one that I'm showing you in this inset here. Although this one has an interesting feature that it is scatter broadened that is from multipath scattering in the inhomogeneous interstellar medium or intergalactic medium. We don't really know where the scattering comes from for FRBs. You can see the telltale scattering tail that lengthens with at lower radio frequencies with a characteristic frequency to the minus fourth power for that exponential tail duration. So some of them show scattering some of them show multi-peaked and complex morphology. So here's a montage. These are actually FRB uh, 121102 uh, events where you can see all sorts of interesting multi-peak structures. This is postage stamps. Each one of these is a different burst. Again, all D dispersed frequency versus time. And you can see this interesting downward drifting frequency structure in some of these bursts. We call that the sad trombone effect because it sort of goes wah, wah, wah. Um, we don't know what it's caused by, but it is seen commonly, particularly among repeating FRBs. Now you might ask the question, okay, where are these coming from? You wanna infer cosmological distances, you should know, why don't you just go and see what galaxy these events are arriving from? And we of course love to identify host galaxies for all fast radio bursts, because that would determine their redshift and, and set the energy scale very unambiguously. And also answer the question, what kind of galaxies are these coming from? Are these young objects or in star formation regions? Are they old objects? Uh, but the problem is that, you know, the Lorimer burst was found with a 64 meter Parks dish, which has 
30, you know, typically somewhere between 15 arc minutes, 30 arc minutes, depending on observing frequency, uh, field of view. And so there's thousands of galaxies that it could come from. And even if you go to Arecibo, which of course has a larger or had a larger diameter, uh, the field of view is smaller, but the, that's still not good enough. You, you really need an, so there's, yeah, there's typically many galaxies in single dish radio telescope error regions. You really need an interferometer like the Very Large Array uh, or VLBA to identify host galaxies. Problem is the sorts of telescopes that are good at discovering FRBs have wide fields of view or relatively wide fields of view, but they can't localize well. The sorts of telescopes that can localize well can't find FRBs because their fields of view are too small. On the other hand, if you have a repeater like 121102, you know where to look. And as long as you're patient, the interferometer can localize it. And this is what was done using the very large array. Uh, the very first repeater, 121102, was localized to within the circles. Here are the Arecibo uncertainty regions. And that dot is um, uh, actually uh, the, the, uh, the counterpart um, as was identified with the, the VLA. And it was then observed optically with the Gemini telescope once we knew the precise localization. And we were quite surprised to find that that repeater is in a dwarf galaxy at redshift point two. So the cosmological distance was confirmed, uh, but I think everyone was surprised that it was in this dwarf galaxy and subsequent observations using the European VLBI network and the VLBA showed that our FRB is in a star formation, not there's also Hubble Space Telescope observations that showed this, which suggests that this repeater is young if it's associated with a star formation, not inside that tiny dwarf galaxy. Um, it was also coincident with a continuum radio source. And you can see this is the uh, radio continuum observations are here. You see it's variable. The red points are where we saw bursts. Um, so the variability of the radio source seems to have nothing to do with the bursts as far as we can tell so far. Uh, and um, that's, it's curious, it's an observational fact. We, we don't yet know what that radio continuum source uh, could be, could be related to the star formation. But since that time, there's been six more, or at least actually today, as of today, there's 14 more localized. I have a montage here of six more localized fast radio bursts, none of which are repeaters because the Australian telescope SKA Pathfinder or ASCAP which is an array of telescopes in, in, in the um, uh, outback in Australia, it is capable of finding FRBs and of localizing them to arc second precision at the same time. And so today it has localized some 14 FRBs and none of them is in a dwarf galaxy. As far as we know, all of them are associated with massive galaxies. And indeed, here's a, one associated with a beautiful spiral galaxy. The story is, here is still developing. There's quite a diversity in the host galaxy properties. They're certainly all, um, so far, they're all at redshifts of, um, you see the redshifts here, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.4 in that region. Sometimes you find FRBs uh, that are in the outskirts of the galaxies, and that's, uh, that's you know, quite interesting. Um, oftentimes you find them in the spiral arms or in the near the centers of the galaxies. The fact that you can't, so the, the question of the environments of FRBs is quite interesting. The types of galaxies they inhabit is quite interesting. But on top of all that, when you have the red shifts to the galaxies, you can then do interesting um, uh, studies that are relevant for cosmology, like for the missing baryon problem, for example. With just five localizations, or, or five as they called them, gold-plated localizations, which they felt they could include in their statistical sample, Macquart et al. could plot um, redshift on the x-axis and cosmic DM on the y-axis. And what they mean there is extra galactic DM. So they've subtracted off the host contribution, uh, sorry, the subtraction off the Milky Way contribution and also an estimate for the host contribution. That's a problem. You don't know what the host contribution is, but you can take an average estimate, which is what they did. And what they show is that um, this is the Planck cosmology prediction for what you should see 
here. Uh, and the gray region is um, estimated scatter because of large scale structure. Uh, but in any case, what they find is that the FRBs localized with the ASCAP telescope all fall in the expected range, which suggests they have identified the missing cosmic baryons. I think the story here is still developing um, because you know there's estimates and assumptions that have gone into this that uh, I think still need to be checked. But it certainly highlights the importance and the potential of fast radio bursts as novel probes of large scale structure and more. So in the literature, it, it's fascinating. We had a wonderful talk by Amanda Weltman who described a lot of these potential applications of fast radio bursts as cosmic probes. And the reason they're so interesting is because they have this dispersion measure and because you can measure this scattering uh, history of the burst since it's emission. And I haven't had time, but you can also mention measure scintillation. And you can also measure rotation measure when you have polarimetric observations of FRBs. There's so much that gets imprinted on an FRB burst that can teach you about the path, but both uh, some combination of the environment, the local environment and the path to us. So you can study the missing baryons and the distribution of those baryons, whether they're throughout the IGM or concentrated in circumgalactic, circumgalactic media and, and halos. You could study galaxy clusters. <clears throat> if you can find very distant high redshift FRBs, you could in principle study the epoch of reionization. Through polarimetric measurements, the IGM and magnetic fields, you could do gravitational lensing experiments and perhaps constrain nature's dark matter. You can in principle measure cosmological parameters. There's so much you could do. Um, but for all of this, you need more FRBs. So a handful is, is really not gonna do it for you. You wanna determine their nature. You wanna know if they all repeat. You wanna realize their potential as cosmic probes. And for this, really to do this kind of project, you need a radio telescope that has a very wide field of view and high sensitivity. And so that brings me to the CHIME telescope, uh, which is uh, CHIME stands for the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, which is located in Penticton, British Columbia uh, at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. It's in this lovely valley, which shields us from uh, radio, uh, ra radio frequency interference. Well, I mean, it doesn't totally shield us, but it gets a lot of it out. CHIME is an unusual radio telescope in that it consists of cylindrical reflectors there's four of them. They're each 20 meters by 100 meters. So as we like to say in Canada, then units, the collecting area is about five hockey arenas. The cylinders are oriented north-south, and this is a transit telescope. There's no moving parts. So the sky drifts overhead, and uh, we observe the entire sky, uh, the entire northern sky uh, every day, 24-7. Each, the, along the axis of each telescope are 256 dual polarization feeds that are sensitive in the frequency range 400 to 800 megahertz. And the geometry of the telescope in that it focuses in only one dimension allows us to have a very high field of view. So in the north-south direction, our field of view is about 120 degrees in the east-west direction, it's about half a degree depending on radio frequency. So we're talking about 220, you know, roughly speaking, uh, depending on how you calculate it, about 200 square degrees. And that is very good for detecting transients. Of course, the telescope was designed for a cosmological experiment to study redshifted hydrogen gas, um, but it also turns out to be a fantastic transient detector very quickly, this is the CHIME FRB team standing in front of it. So you see the scale of this project. And this is really run by many students and, and postdocs. Um, prior to CHIME's turning on, this was the uh, histogram of the number of FRB detections um, by the different experiments. And uh, now that CHIME has turned on, we're finding hundreds of fast radio bursts, uh, which uh, is very helpful for the field. And one of the first things that we did, because we see the sky every day, over and over again, it's very easy for us compared to other telescopes to identify repeating FRBs. And so we've published our first 18 uh, repeaters. So prior to this, there was only the 121102, the Arecibo repeater known. And you can see a sort of a montage of some of our repeater bursts. 
And when you have many repeaters and you have many FRBs, you can start to do interesting statistical comparisons between repeaters and non-repeaters. And so one of the first things we noticed is that repeater bursts tend to be broader, that the durations of repeater bursts, and you can see here in this, in this plot, this was at the very start when we only had 12 non-repeaters. Since then, we have hundreds, and I'll show you better plots of this in a second. We have, you see, the non-repeaters are all very narrow. They fall in this first bin, whereas the repeaters are, are quite broad. They extend in, in much wider in pulse width. So it's interesting, suggestive possibly different emission mechanisms. We started finding strange things in our repeaters as well. We were very surprised to find a 16-day periodicity in one of our repeaters. You can see here in the plot, this is the periodogram, and you see the, the spike where we don't see that any of those kind of features in any other sources. And here you can see um, um, the chime exposure now. This is now date on the x-axis, and the chime exposure is in black. We have plenty of exposure outside of the gray activity regions that occur every 16 days. And all the red triangles are where we see bursts. Uh, so it's very clear the source loves to, has activity every 16 days. It's a four day, roughly speaking, four day activity window. And you say, okay, what could cause that? 16 days, could that be an orbit? Is this object in orbit around another star? Is, it, is that a rotation period or is that a precession period? And, and Bing Zhang's talk, I think, probably will address that. I think one new result that just recently came out of the Apertif low far telescopes, um, also um, combining with chime data on the right, you can see that the lowest frequency, the low far observations are seen in this plot too, tend to come later in that activity phase, in that activity window. So that there's a frequency dependent activity window, which is, which is quite curious. We heard some interesting uh, ideas for what could cause that in the FRB session that occurred Monday and, and Thursday of this week. Another big surprise that we had with Chime FRB was the detection of a luminous, very luminous radio burst from a Milky Way magnetar. I see, how much time do I have left? Have I run out of time? Uh-oh, are you all gone? It's so exciting that we, <laughs> that <laughs> we, have, uh, uh, we are still following. Uh, I think you still have five minutes. Five minutes, okay, that's, that should be fine, especially if I talk really quickly, but I'll try not to do that. Um, Chime discovered, uh, uh, as well, a Caltech um, experiment. Um, Bochanek et al. saw it simultaneously these radio bursts from a galactic magnetar, extremely bright. This lit up the Chime telescope. Um, and that brings us to this plot on the right, uh, which shows distance in parsecs on the x-axis and observed fluence on the y-axis. The galactic radio pulsars are here and FRBs are over here. You see very far in distance. And um, you know, the, the previously we've seen some radio emission from magnetars, but it's all been relatively faint. In fact, the brightest one is over here. So quite a bit brighter than even the crab giant pulses, which line up, which appear on this line. But the Chime FRB source, the, the, the SGR with the huge br bright luminous event that happened last April is way up here. It's much, much brighter uh, than any galactic radio uh, you know, neutron star we've ever seen. And these lines, now these diagonal lines are lines of constant energy. And you can see that the energetics involved in this magnetar burst are starting to be comparable to those of, of the lowest energy FRBs. So they line up and if this source had happened in a nearby galaxy, it would have looked just like an FRB. On the other hand, there's plenty of FRBs that are many orders of magnitude. This is, this is three orders of magnitude per line, six, over six orders of magnitude more energy than is seen here. So it suggests that um, you know, some FRBs could be magnetars, but I'm not sure all FRBs are necessarily magnetars. Recently, we also found a very nearby FRB uh, located in the outskirts of M81, the M81 spiral galaxy. It looks like it's far in the outskirts, but it, this is an H1 map over here where you can see, in fact, it's well within the H1 disk of M81, 
which is at 3.6 megaparsecs. So this is the closest known FRB and it makes it a great target for prompt and other follow-up observations um, uh, with X-ray telescopes and that is currently underway. And very new, very recently, thanks to European VLBI network, observations and detection of the source, it's been localized to a globular cluster in the M81 system, which is very curious because globular clusters have old stellar populations and magnetars are very young objects as far as we know. Now, could you form a magnetar from say merging neutron stars? I don't know, perhaps, but it's very curious. And very finally, in the last couple of few minutes, I want to mention we've just put out our first catalog of 535 fast radio bursts from Chime FRB. That's from 492 different sources. Um, some of the observations we've been able to do with this treasure trove of data, we now have a very nice log N log S relation with a power law index for the cumulative fluence distribution of minus 1.4 plus or minus 0.11, which is consistent with a non-evolving population in Euclidean space, and you say, wait, they're cosmological, but realize the Chime FRB population, I'll show you shortly the DM distribution, it peaks around 500, which is at a redshift 0.5. So it's not surprising. We think as we detect more events, and we've already, in our paper, we show there's a hint already of deviation from simple Euclidean space. We've measured a very precise sky rate, um, and we have an evidence evidence for very large population of highly scattered undetected events. Oh, uh, is my time time running out? If my time is running out very quickly, I'll just say that we've looked at all sorts of interesting distributions of properties, comparing repeaters with non-repeaters. Um, we've bias corrected our sample very carefully. We've done a very careful distribution on the sky analysis. This is Alex Josefi's work, completely isotropic, no coincidence, with, no, no um, dependence on galactic latitude. Burst morphologies, both the bur uh, comparing repeaters and non-repeaters, the morphologies and spectra are, rata are very, very different, um, suggesting different source classes, perhaps. We've detected a correlation with large scale structure in the redshift range 0.3 to 0.5 which suggests a large fraction of FRBs are in dark matter halos um, as the survey galaxies. I'll skip that one and just summarize. <laughs> There's a lot of observational phenomenology. It's still developing. Um, we're measuring now distributions of properties uh, in addition to individual source properties now. Uh, so I think this is all going to come together in the next few years and we'll be able to address the major open questions which I list here, but um, for time, I'll just, just keep it up there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have, uh, uh, we missed the chair person, therefore I take this duty. Let's see if there are questions or otherwise we proceed to, to the next lecture. There is a question in the discussion, yes. uh, question answer. Please okay. have Jenny Wagner. Maybe she can uh, Jenny Wagner. directly ask the question, please. Are repeating uh, FRB coming from gas-rich regions in host galaxies? Yes. Can you hear me? I was just wondering whether the sad trombone effect might be caused by some delay due to gas scintillation, scatter broadening, something like this. Yeah, so there were two questions asked. So I'll, I'll answer the second one first. Um, so there are uh, plasma lensing models for FRBs. There it could be some sort of propagation effect. However, generally speaking in those models, they don't predict only the downward drifting. You might also see upward drifting. So uh, we don't really know what the source of the Chad trombone effect is, but at least in the, um, in the propagation models we've seen, there isn't a reason to prefer a certain direction. And then to the first question that Remo asked about whether they come from gas rich regions. Well, I just mentioned, we just localized one repeater to a globular cluster. Um, so some of them, yes, uh, seem to be in fairly gas, so the FRB 121102s in a star formation region, it's rich with gas, um, but, um, the second repeater, the, the periodic repeater, is just sits just outside a star formation region. So there's not that many repeaters localized, and the story is still uh, diverse. 
Okay, uh, thank you very, thank you very much. much. Let's proceed with Bing Zhang then. Bing Zhang, are you there? Are you ready to go? Yes, sure. Good. Let me share Good. my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, hold on. Sorry for that. Let me go check something. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Remo and all, all organizers for the hard work and for the invitation. And uh, it's my pleasure to talk about the physical mechanisms of fast radio bursts following the nice review of uh, Vicky. Um, so I will start with this figure. Uh, this shows the number of publications actually made by D. Lee. Uh, number of publications in the GRB field as compared with in the FRB field, but FRB field is reduced by a factor of 40%. And this is in early years of the two fields. So GRB, you can read off from, from the upper axis and the FRB can, can be read off from the lower axis. You can see scaled by a factor of 40%, they are comparable. And then the GRB field um, booms up and I believe FRB uh, number will continue to rise. Um, this was a slide uh, I presented three years ago at MG15. And back then I was comparing these two fields. They are as, uh, addressing three same questions. Are they astrophysical? Where are they and uh, what make them? And it turns out that back then the, uh, I think FRBs were just localized. We, we knew where they are, but back then I put a, a huge question mark here. Uh, what make them It's very difficult to answer. But three years later, so this is the same table uh, added one more column, are, they, uh, are there multiple types? So you can see the comparison between the two fields, they just went parallel and uh, the FRB field proceeds at the accelerated rate because we actually answered uh, what made them at, at least partially as we could just mentioned, at least uh, some FRBs coming from the magnetars. So this is so amazing. And this field has been a lot of fun as Wiki uh, uh, gave an excellent uh, review from the observational aspect. So the, from the theorist uh, pers perspective, we are doing a job similar to a detective. So we basically using the fingerprints, footprints, sometimes a smoking gun and trying to figure out the crime scene uh, and uh, so this was the uh, theory wiki uh, um, page, um, which has been there for a while. I think it's, uh, there are 50 some models, but this was before the detection of the FRB from the um, um, Milky Way Manitar. And on this day at 2020-04-28, this even happened. And this completely changed um, the, the field. Uh, one of my colleague uh, joked it that this was the collapse of the wave function, uh, uh, FRB wave function, because before this event, there are 50 possibilities and now there's a uh, confirmed possibility, but probably there are other possibilities as well. But we do know that at least some FRBs are produced by magnetars. And um, from the model, for theoretical aspect, the any FRB model uh, should be composed of two parts. If you look at the literature, uh, you can see that all the models, they are actually talking about two things uh, and then combined together. One is the source model. So this is the uh, where the 50 uh, possibilities actually came from. Uh, including repeating models, non-repeating models, catastrophic models. We, we still don't know whether these guys exist. But the other aspect is trying to understand how the radio waves are produced. So this is closely connected to the coherent radiation mechanism um, 
of the plasma. And there are two subtypes. One is inside the magnetosphere, the other is outside magnetosphere from the relativistic shocks. This one is more like a pulsar model, this is more like a GRV model. And there are uh, many varieties under these uh, general categories. Um, theorists can do this in two uh, opposite directions. One is the bottom up. So one may pick up one of these models, one of the source models, one of the uh, radiation models and go upwards and trying to stick to this particular model and just say, okay, this model can interpret a, a variety of the observations. When new observations come out, they will think hard how this model can reproduce the data. Um, pros and cons. The pro is that um, people can really, for example, this particular, uh, there is a particular coherent mechanism. We can do a detailed uh, numerical simulations. We can figure out all the detailed physics. Um, the con is probably the FRB is simply not through this mechanism. There could be other mechanisms. Uh, and uh, we all know theorists are stubborn <laughs> and they are also highly com competitive. Um, a, a, competi a competitive theorist can make any model work to interpret any observations. So uh, in this uh, approach, then there turns out the risk that um, different people are talking about different things and they never uh, can convince uh, each other. The other approach is the top-down approach. So we start from the observations and ask ourselves, okay, what this observation really tell us? And then we go down to the branches and try to uh, eliminate some of the possibilities and try to um, uh, hopefully identify the correct mechanism, which is a difficult job as uh, indeed. But my talk will try to go through this direction, uh, top-down approach or the detective's approach. But since I myself is also a theorist, sometimes I will uh, jump to the stubborn side and trying to discuss the uh, uh, bottom-up approach. Okay, so the talk is the physical mechanism of fast radio first a detective's approach. Um, so let's just forget about all the models and starting from some of the very basic observational facts and trying to constrain the uh, physical properties of the sources. Vicky already touched some of these. The first one is the, just the duration. Based on duration, multiplied by speed of light, we can get a uh, size. And this size is the um, size of the central engine, which is uh, 10, uh, uh, 100 kilometers, essentially. Um, so this argument actually comes from, um, say, this simple argument, if this is an uh, optically thin region, and this suddenly everywhere uh, there is an um, impulsive uh, emission from everywhere, just based on the propagation delay, the light propagation delay, there is a delta T and this delta T is defined by the distance divided by C. Uh, in other words, this distance should be uh, delta T times C. But this um, argument is act actually did not consider the motion, especially the relativistic motion of the emitter. So actually, if the emitter is moving relativistically, in principle, this emission region can be much, much greater. It can be greater by a factor of gamma squared. But on the other hand, so this is the case actually for the relativistic shock model of FRBs. But this does not really change uh, the constraint on the central engine itself because the delta T in the emission region would be connected to another delta T from the central engine, which is much shorter. And uh, these two are connected by a factor of gamma square. And then the, from here to here, it decreased by a factor of gamma square. So the observed time scale is roughly the time scale of the central engine. So this constraint actually immediately tells us that the source has to be something compact, like a neutron star or a stellar mass black hole. In the literature, there have been discussions about white dwarfs, 
uh, or regular stars or AGNs. So these sources are much larger than this. <laughs> In order to have these models to work, one really needs to introduce some fine-tuned condition to make a small region of uh, these objects to emit. For example, white dwarfs, we have to probably go to the polar cap. For AGM, we have to have some small blob. And for stars, we really need to have a very small patch. So this is the first constraint. So we need to have a compact object. The second constraint is energetics. So if we use the uh, flux and fluence uh, observed from individual FRBs, we can, uh, based on the uh, distance, either directly measured from redshift or estimated from the DM, one can actually estimate the luminosity and energy, but these are isotropic ones. So we don't know the beaming. We can only assume that everything emitted isotropically and we get these numbers. And uh, as Wiki already mentioned, there's a wide range of distribution for both luminosity and energy. For the luminosity, it ranges from 10 to 37, to 10 to 46 ergs per second, where isotropic energy is ranging from several times 10 to the 34. This is the globular cluster that probably we, uh, we could just mention, and all the way 10 to 43. Um, this is, let's talk about energetics of the source for one off burst, if the burst just happened once, and what is, we, we know the energy of the observed FRB, but what's the energy of the source? <laughs> or the luminosity. So we need to do two corrections. Number one, we need to correct for the beaming, which means if the emission is beamed in the narrow solid angle, delta omega, then the total energy or luminosity should be smaller by this factor. On the other hand, we should also correct for the radio efficiency because whatever object it is, for example, magnetar, it will, it makes something else, for example, the galactic magnetar radiated X-rays other than radio. So there's a radio efficiency uh, factor you need to divide by that. So this one tends to increase the energy and this one tends to be to decrease the energy. Uh, for one off burst, we can do this, even though we, we actually don't know these numbers. For repeaters, we actually uh, care about the, um, so during the, entire lifetime, how many uh, energy is released and on average, how, how much luminosity it is radiating. So besides uh, worry about th these factors, we have to also consider the burst rate. So number of bursts emitted per unit time, per unit energy range. We also uh, need to worry about the duty cycle, uh, for example, periodic. Uh, FRBs, so they, they are quiescent during certain phases and uh, active in some other phases. Um, and we can eventually compare these constrained energetics to a certain source model, uh, and those sources probably invoke magnetic energy, spin energy, gravitational energy, or kinetic energy. So this is the very general um, constraint one should uh, uh, place to any, to any source models. The third one uh, we can also mention is the brightness temperature, just based on the luminosity and the duration of uh, the FRBs, one can derive something called the brightness temperature. This is not the true temperature. This is just say effective imaginary temperature because if it is black body radiation, we know black body radiation luminosity is proportional to T to the fourth power and the area. Uh, and the, the duration actually gives you a characteristic length and uh, an area. Uh, and then one can make a connection between the luminosity and the temperature. So these are the black body emission and this is 1000K, 100K. And we are talking about the 10 to the 36K way above there. So which means if FRBs are produced by thermal radiation, the temperature is huge. But that is not the case. Uh, it just says that uh, there's no way to, to produce this uh, incoherently because any radiation magnet will undergo um, uh, self-absorption. -absor so this is how this uh, uh, radiogenic regime developed. Um, in order to avoid that, we need to come up with some coherent radiation mechanism. Um, 
which in the literature, there are three broad types. The first one is just like an antenna uh, for TV. So we have electrons moving globally coherently uh, to, to emit as bunches. So instead of each particle, so the emission power, uh, instead of we're talking about individual electrons, we are talking about a group of uh, electrons uh, bunched together as a huge charge and let it emit coherently. <laughs> And the second type is the plasma maser. So because we, need, we know that emission source must be plasma form and the plasma have certain instabilities. There are some oscillations, some uh, wave modes. They can grow as a function of time. They can reach to very large amplitudes and eventually that oscillation will, uh, that, that uh, electromagnetic wave in plasma can be uh, converted to electromagnetic wave uh, essentially in vacuum propagate all the way to Earth. The third one is already electromagnetic uh, wave, uh, but uh, they travel, they call vacuum maser, but not exactly vacuum. There's still um, uh, plasma in front, but there's a negative absorption. Uh, the emission will continuously get negatively absorbed, which means amplified so that one can reach a very high brightness temperature. And uh, this plot actually shows that all different, um, the astrophysical uh, radio sources. Uh, so this region is the incoherent radiation regime. You can see the brightness temperature goes up in this direction and FRBs are uh, at the almost high, uh, at the highest and radio pulsars are slightly lower, some of them are comparable. Um, so that is the th third, general constraint. The fourth general constraint is about the absorption processes. So in order to have uh, radio waves to reach Earth, um, we have to avoid some, uh, some um, absorption or scattering processes. One is called induced Compton scattering. So this optical depth drops rapidly with electron Lorentz factor and bulk motion can also help to reduce the optical depth. Um, and for free free absorption, uh, as we already mentioned, uh, if we are in a uh, hot dense uh, medium like a supernova remnant, then initially the radio wave just cannot penetrate through. So it takes time for the supernova shell to become transparent. Uh, for synchrotron absorption, so if some sources are likely surrounded by some uh, persistent uh, um, source, which could be powered by synchrotron, and that synchrotron nebula could also absorb the uh, uh, FRB emission. Uh, on the other hand, the, some of the absorbed FRB could heat up the network. So these are the general processes that limit uh, the uh, detection of FRBs. We need to worry about this in theoretical modeling. The fourth one is uh, we can observe a lot of uh, uh, interesting properties in polarization. And most of the FRBs are highly linearly polarized some of them are close to 100% uh, in, in terms of uh, linear polarization. And uh, one can also look at the uh, evolution of polarization angles uh, across uh, the burst. Some of them are constant, some of them are varying. And with polarization, we can measure how that polarization angle evolved with frequencies as a so-called Faraday rotation measure. And it turns out that uh, a lot of FRBs have uh, quite large RN. So all these actually suggest that the emitter and even the nearby environments has to be uh, strongly magnetized. Uh, especially in the emission region, we actually require ordered B view. So in any case. And because we don't know how FRBs are produced, uh, people, uh, usually appeal to two neighboring fields, the gamma ray bursts and the radio pulsars, because we uh, more or less know how um, um, the emission are um, radiating those sources. So the lesson from the TRB field, for many years, people have developed this relativistic shock model, including both internal shocks to produce gamma rays and external shocks to produce um, afterglows. <laughs> And actually such kind of picture was borrowed to interpret the FRBs uh, with some addition. So in the GRB shocks, they are not magnetized. 
for FRBs because, as I said, polarization requires um, an ordered magnetic field. So usually these shocks, not only they're relativistic, uh, they're also magnetized. Uh, people need to introduce an uh, ordered B field in, their, uh, in the shocks and start to, um, to make the electrons to emit coherently. Uh, some mechanism called synchron synchrotron masers Actually, they are cyclotron, close to cyclotron and close to uh, bunches uh, instead of masers. But this is a um, uh, name people have been using uh, all the way. So there are many authors discussing these mechanisms. Uh, and another one that's from the radio pulsar community, um, people have been trying to understand the coherent radio emission from the magnetosphere, uh, either from the inner region uh, or somewhere in the outer magnetosphere close to the light cylinder. And uh, in the pulsar field, there are, there are also inner and gap, uh, inner and out, inner gap and outer gap, or slot gap, or uh, sometimes it's slightly outside the light cylinder, uh, the current uh, sheet region. It could be another site. Uh, so, as a result, for the uh, FRBs, uh, we have two competing models. Um, so one is the pulsar-like, the other GRB-like. And in particular, uh, for this uh, 2004 or 28, the galactic FRB, these two models have been discussed to interpret a variety of the uh, observed uh, uh, properties. So for the, um, uh, so both models invoke, invoke a magnetar. And we need to have a magnetar to do something, probably a cross cracking and send out some alpha waves, um, can heat up the magnetosphere, make x-rays. And then there, there could be a probably open field line region where particles can actually come out and eventually make radiation, uh, coherent radiation somewhere. These two models have different predictions in terms of beaming angle. The pulsar-like model, because we're talking about the magnetosphere, they're likely narrowly beamed. And the GRB-like model, because it is outside the magnetosphere and for magnetized jets, there's um, a little collimation. So uh, very likely this uh, magnetized relativity shock are wider. In terms of radio efficiency, pulsar-like models have a relatively high radio efficiency, which means have slight, uh, uh, relatively less energy going to high, high energies, but for shock model, we assume uh, produce more energy actually in the high energies. So this is related to brightness of the high energy counterparts and the polarization properties. This is very interesting. Uh, both models could in principle produce uh, near 100% linear polarization. But in the pulsar-like model, it depends on where the radiation region is. If it is close to the polar cap, uh, then one probably can make a polarization swing, just like um, what is observed in radio pulsars. If the emission region is far out, and probably you see a straight field lines and the polarization angle would not change much. But for the um, uh, shock model, uh, because we are talking about the parallel B field uh, uh, in the shock plane, uh, it is uh, hard to produce uh, significant, significant variation, uh, especially sudden changes in the polarization angle. Uh, so this is the top-down approach. Uh, observationally, we do see that for repeaters, the first repeater actually, their polarization angle is constant, but some non-repeating FRBs, one can see this jump, so polarization angles. Uh, so as I, I said, for this constant polarization case, one can do it in both the shock model and the magnetic sphere model. But for this one, uh, likely we need a uh, magnetic sphere model to do this. And even for repeaters, uh, actually this is a repeating source, uh, Another repeating source, one can see that the polarization angle can change significantly from burst to burst. This one going up, this one going down with some dips and all these complicated behavior. It is more reasonable to understand within the magnetosphere model, but it's hard to do it in the shock mode. 
Uh, another constraint from the observation is the uh, burst rate, as Vicky already mentioned, uh, for 12.1102, uh, fast detecting more than a thousand bursts uh, within a uh, time span of uh, less than two months. Um, and uh, there's a yeah, distribution of numbers as a function of energy. There's also distribution of the uh, uh, waiting time. Uh, you can see there's a very high repetition rate and short waiting time. Sometimes you have uh, after milliseconds, you have another one and continue to do this on and on. Um, this actually places some constraints to models. For example, if your trigger mechanism is very expensive, then you cannot do this. This is very frequent that you have to, you can do it like, uh, uh, in um, milliseconds uh, or uh, there's a long, yeah, characteristic waiting time for about 100 seconds, you need to generate a lot more. Um, so you know, some of the models just cannot do this. Uh, another thing is one can place the constraint on the energy. For example, if it is the, um, uh, if it is the, uh, um, the shock model, because the efficiency is very low, it means that a lot of energy goes to uh, high energy, then the energy budget is high. Um, the 14 day, 14 seven day uh, burst for this particular event already used up about 1% energy of the magnetic magnet energy. Um, so that is quite expensive. Um, but for magnetosphere model, this number becomes smaller. Uh, I should also say uh, it is not a public yet. Um, FAST, uh, we detected another uh, very active source, um, uh, actually the chime source, and we detected more than a thousand bursts from that one as well uh, with similar properties. Okay, so this is the sad chromium effect Vicky mentioned, which means that arrival time uh, of the lower frequency waves uh, arrive later, um, then there's question how to do this. In the magnetosphere model, actually it's quite straightforward, Sim simply because in the pulsar magnetosphere, we already knew something called the radius to frequency mapping, which means that different frequency actually <laughs> emitted from the different heights. So as the, say, suppose there are some blobs or bunches uh, emitted from the neutron star and trying to uh, move out in different field lines, as your line of sight sweep across the beam, uh, the, the one you see earlier must uh, came from a lower altitude. And as time goes by, you see uh, emission from a higher altitude from a different field line with a lower frequency. So within this model, it's quite straightforward. Within the shock model, you can also do that because at a later time, probably the shock front propagates to a larger distance and B field goes down. Uh, the uh, difficulty is the recalib recalibration for the shock model. For neutron star, there's always a surface. Uh, you can every time start from there, but for uh, shocks, uh, yeah, it could happen uh, in especially for a wide uh, distribution of uh, time, so separated by months. Uh, so we don't know whether the collision will <laughs> happen around the same radius uh, every time. Okay, this is the periodicity uh, Vicky mentioned. Uh, Chime discovered the 16 day period and also has the frequency dependent model. And in the literature, there are three models. Uh, so one of them talking about the magnetar period of this long, uh, which is quite far stretching. Uh, the other two models invoke the uh, binary uh, orbital uh, period or the precession of the magnetar. And uh, this frequency uh, dependent window uh, ruled out that this is due to the eclipsing in the binary system, that is for sure, but it does not rule out the binary scenario. So I'm jumping back to my uh, yeah, theorist uh, approach, the uh, stubborn part <laughs> uh, approach because uh, myself developed this. So actually um, we have a recent uh, model uh, saying that the uh, actually the eclipsing 
it's very uh, actually straightforward to interpret the arrival of uh, high frequency bursts uh, earlier than low frequency ones. Uh, it is a matter of how they disappear later. So that must be um, uh, related to the emission mechanism. For example, if it is magnetic origin and they coming from different altitudes, uh, one can do that. Uh, this has been discussed by Tung um, uh, Zili uh, in a recent paper. Um, okay, so next subject. So we all know that there is a, a FRB magnetar association, uh, well known, but there's also a FRB SGR burst non association. Actually, this we have been using FAST to do uh, long term monitoring for this event and during. Uh, an episode, uh, very active episode. We did well. Fermi detected uh, about uh, thirty uh, gamma ray bursts, but there's no radio emission at all. Not FRB, not even a radio pulse. So this is quite constraining. And uh, several possibilities could be due to narrow beaming, due to narrow spectrum, or maybe that SGR burst is very special. There are already several papers. Uh, pointing towards this possibility. But the beaming is uh, also uh, one interesting possibility. This one is uh, essentially ruled out. So if it is due to beaming, then uh, one should expect to see some of the events off the axis uh, for the galactic magnetars. For cosmological FRBs, these probably are too faint to, to be detected. But for the galactic magnetar, we could see this uh, bursts which have a wider or slower um, width uh, and lower um, flux. So I call them slow radio bursts compared to fast radio bursts. And there is a um, so-called closure relations. Um, the luminosity of these guys uh, should be related to the luminosity of the uh, FRBs uh, or the flux should be related to the FRBs and the width should be also related to FRB through certain uh, closure relation. It depends on the intrinsic spectrum uh, of the FRB. Um, so if the observational frequency is the same, so basically we, we have this simple relation. If it is a power law, if it is a Gaussian, then it becomes a little bit more complicated. And there are several actually fainter, uh, slower bursts detected already, but uh, uh, only one or two seems to be consistent with, but a lot of them are not. Um, but this is very uh, interesting um, uh, test. We have to search for slower bursts from these events and trying to, 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 to match these conditions and see uh, whether or not they are off-axis FRBs. In that case, one can really uh, confirm this beaming hypothesis of FRBs. Okay, the open questions, um, there are more than three, but I list the three uh, interesting ones. Where is the FRB emission generated, whether it is magnetospheres or shocks? So, uh, and what is coherent mechanism? So this one, uh, it is still subject to a hard debate and I believe, especially the second part, what is coherent mechanism? It will take time to, to, to get it. Are there engines other than magnetars that power FRBs? If so, what could be the plausible sources? I'll discuss this one in the next slide. Are there generally non-repeating FRBs? If so, what could be the plausible sources? This is also very interesting. Uh, time uh, will tell. So these are the two extreme versions of the source models. Uh, besides magnetars, what can we have? So this, um, Extreme is saying that all the FRBs are produced by magnetars. We have uh, regular repeaters um, produced by regular magnetars. This is assuming that there's no non-repeaters. So all the FRBs are repeaters. So just some of them, just uh, the, the repetition rate is too low. And they're all produced by regular magnetars. And there are some active uh, repeaters. Those active repeaters probably are produced by special magnetars probably born from the long GRBs or neutron star mergers or superluminous supernovae. They are rapidly spinning and younger. So this is the one extreme view. The other extreme view I think uh, is, it could be more exciting is that besides magnetars, we have other things. For repeaters, we have magnetars, we have some other things. 
And we even we have non-repeaters, uh, intrinsically non-repeaters. They are probably related to compact star, combined binary coalescence, blizzards, and other things. Um, probably the reality sit somewhere in between. They're probably not like 50 different ways of making FRVs, but uh, if there's just one way to make it, we probably underestimate the creativity of nature. Uh, so somewhere in between is uh, what we, we would expect, but it takes time to find out. Um, Vicky also touched this um, globular cluster FRB. So it is very interesting. So the distance is 3.6 megaparsec, very close. And it's sitting right there in a globular cluster. And in terms of energy uh, or um, luminosity, so it is actually even lower than the galactic FRB. So they are quite uh, moderate bursts. They are bridging the gap uh, between the radio pulsars and the cosmological FRBs. Uh, then question is, uh, do we have a magnetar there? As Vicky said, magnetar um, in the globular uh, cluster environment, it's hard to have young stars. You can use double neutron star to, to merge to make a magnetar, but uh, most of the K-mergers will probably make a short-lived uh, magnetar uh, lasting for um, hundreds of seconds or just one second and it collapse into a black hole. Um, one can probably uh, argue for um, accretion-induced collapse of white dwarfs, uh, white dwarf mergers. Those uh, possibilities are open, but I'd like to discuss another possibility so this possibility actually was published uh, last year uh, uh, before knowing this. I think it uh, could be a promising candidate. Um, so the, instead of having a post-merger magnetar, we are talking about two neutron stars spiraling in. Um, and if we really work, on the, work out the how, when these two magnetic spheres start to interact with each other, we find that it happens actually uh, decades, uh, centuries, or even thousands of years uh, before the merger. And uh, because the energy budget is pretty small for this one, so I think even for uh, this um, minor interactions, one can already probably produce these uh, repeaters. Uh, so these uh, are estimates of the energy of the system. So eventually uh, the FRBs are produced through say reconnection or dissipation of the magnetic energy, but the magnetic energy can be re replenished actually coming from uh, the spin energy of the stars. So, and the spin energy of the both neutron stars are plenty to power these. Something like the, uh, the solar uh, magnetic cycle. So every round uh, there are magnetic dissipation. And after that, um, the, uh, the sun goes to Python state, but from the Rotation energy, you can tap more magnetic energy, and after a while, it will produce a burst again. So, um, these guys could be uh, relatively abundant in global clusters, uh, and that uh, time scale is much longer than the, uh, say, uh, the post emerging magnetar uh, case. And this model actually uh, predict that these sources could become more and more active as a function of time because the two become closer and closer and there are more and more um, dissipation happening. And very interestingly, these guys should be uh, millihertz gravitational wave sources because they are at that distance, they could be detected, especially at this small distance, they could be detected by Lisa, Taiji, Tianqing, some uh, space-based gravitational waves uh, after they are launched in 2030s. Okay, so uh, I think that's all. I summarize uh, my talk. For coherent emission models, uh, there's a, a debate between location, magnetosphere, and shocks. And uh, it turns out that uh, at least from the top down approach, the current uh, data supports the magnetosphere's origin for um, uh, at least some and probably uh, all of the FRBs. And source models, the most conservative ones, many times do it all, and the most speculative ones, there are many uh, different types. The prospects, observationally, uh, probably will detect the galactic FRBs more um, uh, with chime and stair two and other detectors, 
Maybe next one also come from Manitou, maybe not. Maybe they come from something else. And then we know that there are other uh, FRB sources. Multi-messenger observations can hold the key to identify or eliminate models. For example, the, the scenario I, I just mentioned, it could be in principle detecting gravitational waves. In from theory aspect, the debate on the coherent mechanism will continue uh, if the pulsar field could be any guide uh, after um, 60 years, people are still debating which coherent mechanism. I believe this should be also the case uh, for the field of FRBs. And uh, for the source, the Manitar, uh, how Manitars make FRBs, uh, there are already been a lot of studies. Uh, I believe there, there will be a lot more. Uh, and also the physics of other systems, um, of course, with the bre observation breakthrough and the study of other systems will, will, um, um, will become a uh, more uh, harder topic. Okay, I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you. We have questions. Well, first of all, let me thank you for this uh, very informative talk, pre presentation. The thank work, you. Uh, the, um, as uh, beautiful and interesting as the one of Vicky Caspi. You made a good team. Now, let's see if there are questions. Yes, I would have a question. I'm Jenny Wagner. And I would like to ask, um, what can you learn from the de-dispersed resolved pulse shapes? So for instance, from the CHIME catalog, which has been recently released about the sources and the emission mechanisms. So when you see the intensity over time in the de-dispersed regime. Yeah, that, that is a very good question. So if we see multiple uh, pulses within the burst, this within the pulsar like model, one can actually try to diagnose into the emission beam, say what kind of fuel lines are making uh, radiation. So with more and more data, probably one can uh, try to map something like a radius to frequency map or, uh, uh, or, or something. But for the, the shock model, one needs to really answer uh, within this short period of time because every the shocks are consecutive. So with one collision, you produce a single charm laser and that plasma is already heated up. But when another one comes in, there's a should be a prediction that, the, the, for example, the, the degrees of coherence, uh, those kinds of things uh, have to, 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 to change according to a, a certain pattern. If this is not observed, then in the shock model, one really needs to argue for some independent collisions. For example, even though we see like three pulses overlapping each other, they have to say that, okay, we have three collisions at different locations. Uh, of course, with that freedom, they can interpret everything, but it is uh, less uh, elegant. You basically kick the ball back to the central engine and ask, ask the central engine to do whatever trick to produce the data. Thank you very much. Thanks. Another question from Susan, sir, please. Oh, hello. Um, what's the uh, energy spectrum of the FRP look like? Yeah, it's a, a very good question. It is not well measured, but uh, um, uh, early on, if we uh, really um, assume that they are uh, power law spectrum, then it turns out that spectral index very significantly uh, for 12.11.02, uh, some bursts have like negative uh, 14, some others have positive 10. So that actually already hints towards a very narrow spectrum. Actually from the uh, CHIME observation uh, and, and other uh, telescope observation, one can see that FRBs are detected not in the entire uh, bandwidth, actually in a certain bandwidth. That points towards something like a Gaussian-like or even line-like emission, uh, at least for some of the FRBs. I believe, uh, uh, Vicky, correct me if I'm wrong, 
for the repeaters, uh, they are more narrower and looks like more lung like and for non repeaters, it's more like uh, uh, parallel like. We get, am I right? Yeah, that's, that's uh, definitely true. There's complex spectral structure in repeater bursts, not all repeater bursts, but in most repeater bursts. And there's definitely a different population that seem broadband, at least as far as the bandwidths of any one telescope um, show. Seems there are no more questions. Uh, maybe we can thank the speakers of all this session again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Now we are starting the round table uh, on the particular JRD source. 17.08.17. And we have uh, two talks uh, scheduled. So the first talk is by Eleonora Toria. Could you please uh, share your screen, Eleonora? Yeah, we can see uh, you. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. One second, I will. Uh, um... Okay, let me see. Okay. Abbassa la cosa, ti ma non si vedono gli occhi. Ora si dovrebbero vedere le slide. Perfetto, perfetto. No, ma anche te. <laughs> no, sono, non, non so bene come farlo funzionare sull'iPad. E... Beh, iniziamo, non, non perdiamo uh, tempo. Um, uh, so uh, I was um, uh, asked to review the current status of the X-ray observations of GW170817. Uh, so I would like to thank Remo for inviting me at this very interesting meeting. Uh, and uh, I am I'm sure you all heard already many talks about this uh, source. Um, I will start with... Um, uh, timeline uh, of this uh, uh, event, um, summarizing the most important moment of the discoveries. Uh, so uh, initially, uh, as you can uh, see, we had the merger uh, discovery by the uh, gravitational wave uh, observatories. And this was followed by uh, uh, rather weak gamma ray burst of a short duration, which was uh, discovered by Fermi and also detected by Integral. You see in, in this picture the correlation between the uh, merger signal and the gamma ray signal, which peaks 1.7 seconds later. Uh, so this uh, uh, signal was not only temporally uh, close to the merger event, uh, it was also in a location in the sky that is consistent with the um, uh, localization provided by the gravitational wave uh, observations. You can see in this plot in pink red, you, you see the Fermi localization and here in green, uh, you see the localization of the gravitational wave transient. So for this reason, because of the temporal and spatial coincidence, we thought the two events were indeed associated and coming from the same system. And what uh, was even uh, um, more exciting for observers is that the volume enclosed by this uh, gravitational wave uh, uh, event was very small. So you can see the area in the sky uh, was uh, uh, a few tenths of square degrees. And also the distance was uh, approximately 40 megaparsec. So looking at, at the number of galaxies that could have hosted this event, we did not have 
much choices. And this is good because there were at most 50 candidates that could have been the host galaxy of, uh, of this uh, um, transient event. So what happened is that uh, many telescopes around the globe started to observe. Either they cover the full area of the um, uh, of the sky um, lo localized by LIGO and Virgo, or they targeted these dots, which are the galaxies um, uh, candidate to host uh, the the gamma ray burst. And uh, about 11 hours later, we had the first report of a possible counterpart, which was a very bright optical source that you see here located in the um, inner regions of an elliptical galaxy, NGC 4993, at about 40 megaparsec. And uh, what became really interesting is that a few hours after the optical uh, detection, there was a swift observation uh, and swift reported uh, the lack of uh, X-ray emission. And this for us was, was really the first sign that we were not looking at a standard afterglow because of the bright optical UV emission and the deep limit on the X-ray observations at early times. Uh, we understood this was probably a thermal component, very different from a GRB afterglow. So the afterglow itself uh, came uh, up later, a much later time. And the first uh, detection of the afterglow was carried out by uh, my team with Chandra uh, nine days after the, the merger. And you see here the Chandra discovery image. Uh, what you see here at the center, this bright source is the galaxy nucleus. And here, this is the location of the optical infrared transient. And at the same location, we see this red dot is the X-ray counterpart. So it came the, uh, you know, at the very uh, end. Uh, and a week later, uh, radio observations carried out with the VLA um, also uncovered at the same location uh, radio counterpart. And so this gave us an indication that this X-ray and radio were uh, probing a different component of non-thermal emission. So now that we are uh, nearly four years after the event, um, we can see here the evolution of the X-ray emission. Uh, you see at the center, this is uh, the field uh, of, uh, um, of the transient. And you see at the center, there is this bright nucleus. But you can also uh, see in this stacked image, uh, we can resolve that there is a diffuse uh, soft X-ray emission in which the transient is embedded. And here, a 10 arc second from, from the galaxy nucleus, uh, you see the X-ray counterpart. And in the uh, stamps that you see here, uh, you can uh, um, see the temporal evolution of the transient. Uh, you see at two days, there was nothing detected by Chandra. The first detection was this uh, uh, weak but significant source in nine days. And then very surprisingly, it did not fade like all the afterglow seen by Swift, but it, it became brighter and brighter. So you see at a hundred days, it was five times brighter. Uh, it reached its peak at 160 days. And then after that, it started to decay really fast. You see, uh, at one year was, uh, uh, was faint again. Uh, but uh, with great surprise, you know, af after this point, the decay became, I would say, shallower than what we expected. And indeed, uh, we're still detecting this source at 3.5 years after the merger. You see it's weak, but thanks to Chandra, we, we can still claim a significant detection. So um, here uh, I show the temporal evolution of, uh, of the non-thermal component that we observe in X-ray, uh, in radio, and at late time also in the optical range. And uh, uh, the 
the you know salient features are first of all this uh, initial rise of the emission uh, with a slope of about 0.8, which is quite shallow. Then we have this peak at very late times, 160 days, and then a steep temporal decay with a slope of about minus 2.1. And so <clears throat> if we look at the spectrum of the source, uh, this is a, a remarkably uh, long-lived power law. Uh, you see from 15 days up to one year, um, there was no spectral change. And uh, we can see that the radio, optical, and X-ray data all belong to the same power law component. And so if we um, interpret this as synchrotron emission, uh, so my apology if the symbol are somehow they changed, moving the PowerPoint to the iPad, uh, but uh, um, you can see better in the figure, the regime of synchrotron emission that I'm referring to. Uh, so what you see in this uh, uh, panel here is the typical spectrum of, of a gamma reverse. And you see that uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, for over a year, we were probing always at the same portion of the spectrum. So this was a bit, you know, um, uh, it didn't allow us to constrain all the parameters because we were always probing the same portion of the spectrum uh, at all wavelengths. Uh, but it allowed us to constrain really well the spectral slope. Domattina, quando vieni alle nove. So um, the, the spectral slope, uh, uh, as you see, is constrained really well. Um, we measure an electron spectral index of about 2.17 with a very narrow error. And this is uh, perfectly consistent with the distribution of a spectral index inferred from gamma ray burst afterglows. So from this observation, really, we, we can say this is a uh, 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 special afterglow in any possible way. Um, two keys observation that allowed us to uh, uh, show that there was a relativistic jet um, in, this, uh, uh, in this object were first of all, this high resolution radio imaging. What you see in this case is uh, um, the uh, position of, of the radio emission at two different times. <clears throat> Sorry. And you can see how the uh, centroid of the radio image of the afterglow shifted with time. So this is a, uh, at about 100 days, and this was about 200 days. And because of this shift uh, of the centroid motion, we, we could derive that the source was moving at a relativistic speed. And so this was the first evidence for a relativistic jet. Uh, radio imaging also allowed us to um, uh, measure the shape of, uh, of the uh, image. And uh, this is uh, consistently a compact source. So this allowed also to exclude all those models that were predicting uh, uh, spherical emission. Another important clue that came from the temporal evolution of the afterglow uh, was the late time decay. Uh, so this is important because, you know, in this particular case of 17 or 17, we were really lucky that the source was bright and, and nearby. So uh, high resolution radio imaging was possible, but in the future, we do not expect to be um, uh, you know, so lucky again. So future um, events could be much fainter. And so radio imaging might not be possible. And in this case, you know, a very important alternative is the temporal uh, monitoring of the source. And so what you see here um, is the um, comparison of the data set at late time. So this is uh, the post peak. Uh, evolution from 160 days up to about one year and a half. 
And you see how the data follow really well this blue curve, which is the prediction for a relativistic jet, which is supposed to decay really uh, fast after the peak, while all the models predicting a more uh, isotropic spherical outflow uh, also predict a much shallower temporal decay after the peak. And so by uh, monitoring the afterglow at late times, we were also able to discard these models with high confidence and also um, confirm the presence of a relativistic jet in agreement with the, uh, with the radio observations. So uh, I would say that after this set of, of, uh, of observations at late times, uh, I think many people converge on this picture that the non-thermal component that we observed in radio and X-ray was produced by a relativistic jet. And this jet was, uh, first of all, it was not seen uh, down the barrel of the jet. So we were not looking down this orange axis, but we were slightly shifted at an angle of about 20 to 30 degrees. And the additional uh, feature that observations revealed to us is that this jet had to be surrounded by some sort of wings or cocoon, as people uh, call it, of material that is less energetic and less relativistic. So at the very beginning of the observations, we were watching the uh, emission produced by these lateral wings. And then as time passed, the relativistic jet was decelerated and it started to open up. And so only at late times, our observation started to probe the core uh, of the jet. And so this is the picture that we had after one year of observations. Um, so what I, I want to show here are the comparison between the, and I, I'm sorry again, I think some of the plot were changed uh, in the conversion, uh, but I will try to explain. Um, so what I'm showing here is the comparison of the um, model with the, with the data constraints. And you see on the left, these are uh, the constraints coming from the temporal evolution of the afterglow. And this dotted line is the uh, after the global model from a structured jet. Uh, the viewing angle is about 20 degrees. And you see that it, this model fits really nicely uh, the uh, temporal, um, uh, the light here. Um, and then what you see on the right, uh, these two data points are actually the measurements of the centroid motion from radio imaging. And what you see in blue is uh, the prediction from the model. And this is the 68% contour that you see here in dark blue. There was supposed to be a 95% um, contour also, but it's not visible, but it's about here, it's a bit uh, larger. But in this case, it doesn't matter because you see how the, the model prediction fit nicely all the observing constraints. And this is about at one year. So at this point, our idea was that this was a quite ordinary um, jet from, from a GRB uh, with parameters that are completely consistent with the uh, afterglow parameters of short duration gamma reverse. And at this point, things started to deviate from this simple prediction. And now I want to show you what are what is the status of the observation uh, right now. So you see here again the same figure, but with the updated data set of uh, uh, collected over uh, three years after the um, the gravitational wave event, the gamma reverse. So what you see on the left is again the uh, afterglow light curve. This point in black are the X-ray data point. This point in blue are the radio data, just shifted to, uh, to match the X-ray normalization. But you see the temporal behavior is more or less the same. 
Um, and you see how at the late times, uh, these last few observations are systematically brighter than the prediction of the JET model that we made after one year. And so in order to uh, account for this uh, brighter emission at late times, uh, we need to change uh, some of the afterglow parameters. And so you see how, uh, you know, this a solid line is the model of one year. And you see how it under predicts the emission, both X-ray and radio wavelengths. And uh, the more data we collect, the more our uh, model needs to be fine tuned. And what happens is that in order to account for this late time emission, our viewing angle is changing. So uh, it's, it's shifting from about 20 to nearly 40 degrees right now. And uh, uh, this is not surprising because we know that with the temporal uh, um, uh, monitoring, we actually can constrain the ratio of these two parameters, the viewing angle and the jet opening angle, which is about six. And uh, um, so this is coming from the temporal monitoring. But luckily we have another constraint, which is the centroid motion. And these allow us uh, to place much tighter constraint on the viewing angle. And so as you can see, what is happening at this point is that the, the jet model uh, with large viewing angle of about 40 degrees can reproduce the late time X-ray observations. So they can reproduce this um, bright emission but it starts to uh, under predicts the motion of the centroid. So we are, uh, you know, it's still not uh, a large discrepancy, but definitely we are starting to see a tension between the late time uh, observations of this transient and the simple jet model. And one thing that I wanted to clarify is that you know, um, there were claims that, you know, this last data point was, uh, uh, you know, evidence for this uh, um, uh, rebrightening of the X-ray emission. Uh, I would like to, to know that this is just a, a small deviation from, from the model. And instead what, uh, you know, the, the evidence for uh, attention between the jet model and the data is not coming from this simple last observation, but it's really coming from this persistent trend that we've been witnessing for several months right now. And this, uh, uh, and the, it is this type of, uh, um, of shallower decay that is driving the viewing angle toward larger values and therefore is creating this tension with the radio imaging constraints. And so um, the reason of that uh, clear, is not clear to anyone, it's not clear to me, but it's definitely opening up new um, possibilities to study this, this source. You know, now that uh, the jet um, is, is fading away, we may be able to uh, detect a new component. So one thing that I wanted also to emphasize that while in X-ray we have a significant and, and I would say a robust detection of the X-ray emission, in, in the radio, the signal is really marginal. Uh, you see here the position of the transient is uh, marked by this uh, white circle. And you see here, there is some signal, but we are talking really about um, it's at the level of, of the noise of the image. So uh, it is still not clear whether the radio emission is following what the X-ray is doing or not. Uh, so we'll say these last observations are really driven by the uh, X-ray detection. And so as I was saying before, uh, we have several possibilities open in front of us uh, if this behavior continues to be detected. And this, uh, what I'm showing here is actually a prediction that was made uh, in 2019, uh, suggesting that 
you know, if the central engine of this uh, uh, object uh, is still uh, um, active, as it could be if it is, for example, a massive neutron star, uh, then we should see a flattening of the observed emission. And this could be either at X-ray wavelength only or at all wavelengths. So different models make different predictions. Uh, but depending on the evolution of, of the emission, we, you know, we could be able to test this uh, prediction. Uh, and, and of course, let me point out that the implication of that would be very important for the equation of state of, of a neutron star. Uh, because thanks to the gravitational wave data, we know the mass of the system. So if, if this was really a massive neutron star that was able to survive the merger for such a long time, the implications will be uh, really important for our understanding of these objects and their equation of state. But there is also another uh, uh, realistic possibilities uh, is that we are seeing um, an afterglow, but this time not from the relativistic jet, but from the sub-relativistic ejecta. So we know that these uh, uh, slower moving ejecta were there because we saw the kilonova. And from the optical and infrared observations of the kilonova, people derived that there was a large mass of, uh, of ejecta moving at uh, speed like 30% to the speed of light. And indeed, based on these uh, uh, measurements, uh, we can predict the type of signal that we expect when these ejecta uh, interact with the surrounding media. More or less as it happens, for example, in, in, uh, uh, with the ejecta of supernovae that at late time rebrighten in, in the radio band. So in a very similar way, we could see a brightening of the emission at radio and X-ray wavelength. These are some predictions that we made uh, based on the kilonova observations. And you see there is a wide range of behaviors. So uh, it could remain flat, but it could also rebrighten substantially. Um, one thing to notice is that the time scale will be really slow. So it's gonna take a long-term monitoring of this event to really distinguish between these different possibilities. Um, but again, the implication for this would be very important. Uh, what I wanted to um, show here uh, is that, you know, based on uh, simulations, uh, we know that uh, many of these mergers produce a large amount of ejecta. And most of these ejecta have velocity of about, let's say, 20, 30 percent the speed of light. And this is what we probe with optical and infrared observation. So when we observed the kilonova in 2017, we probed this uh, uh, mass of ejecta. Uh, what we did not probe is this uh, tail of the distribution. So. Um, the presence of this tail, of course, depends on the merger dynamics and the equation of state of the neutron star. Uh, but uh, it seems to be quite a common feature of, uh, of the simulations. And uh, it predicts different slopes uh, of the distribution, depending on, on the details of the merger. And so all these, uh, um, you know, uh, fast moving ejecta are not observed when, when we observe the optical and infrared emission, but they can be probed through this late time X-ray and radio observation. It basically, you know, uh, this, uh, um, the profile of the um, ejecta distribution, the velocity profile of the ejecta is going to shape the light curve of this late time radio flare. So from, from the um, you know, rising part of this light curve, uh, we could derive what is uh, the uh, slope of this distribution. So this would be a very novel measurement that we could do, but also in this case, you know, it will require some time. So here we um, 
uh, made some predictions based on the model. Uh, these were made a year ago, so this was a 2.5 years after the merger is the orange curve. And you see that at that point, basically all the index had equal probability. But if we keep detecting the extra emission for let's say one more year at the same level of the current detection, then we can already place some constraints and say that uh, our observation really favor the uh, steepest uh, slope of the velocity distribution. Um, so I will now uh, conclude my talk. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize um, how X-ray observations were critical in the um, observations of this uh, electromagnetic counterpart. And this is because they could probe really the faintest stages uh, of the uh, electromagnetic emission and no other telescope was really capable of probing that. Um, at, the, at the very beginning, extra observations discovered the non-thermal emission on nine days. And the monitoring of this uh, uh, component allowed us to um, you know, understand that there was a relativistic jet produced by, by the source. Uh, at the very hand, you know, now that the jet is fading away, uh, this late time uh, X-ray monitoring may betray the onset of a new component. And this is a really exciting possibility. Uh, the origin of this component could be either a long lived central engine, for example, a long lived uh, neutron star, or it could be this new type of transient emission arising from the kilonova ejecta. Uh, so um, only new observations could, could tell us the difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eleonora. Beautiful presentation. Now we will hear, uh, I think, the presentation of Orge, where uh, he will present uh, a point of view which we uh, presented already three years ago, but in the meantime, it has been improved and more detailed. Just, uh, just to make sure, I don't know if, uh, if um, I, I know that in the official presentation of LIGO, it was said that they detected first and then Fermi and Integral after, but just to make sure, um, uh, uh, just to make sure to keep the real behavior, is that the first identification, we had a lot of discussion and they are still ongoing. The first identification was from Fermi and Integral. And later on, there was the purported uh, um, uh, uh, detection prior, but with a human intervention, which showed that the uh, LIGO but, uh, was uh, had a signal before, but this matter is very is very delicate, and uh, I don't think it's appropriate to uh, discuss this because this deserves a special a special meeting, and uh, let's uh, instead focusing of the physics of this very nice object that you have present, namely the GRB thirteen. Uh, 17 or 4, 17A, and let's uh, um, all get proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. So, um, yes, I will just, just to start in recalling, as uh, Professor Ruffini just mentioned, that uh, this is an ongoing work uh, based on our first uh, uh, analysis and prediction of uh, of this source in this paper uh, of uh, two years ago, uh, which was about electromagnetic emission of white dwarf binary mergers. So uh, it's um, very intriguing uh, that uh, as I'm going to show that GRB 17 or A17A for us looks very much as a white dwarf binary merger rather than a neutron star, neutron star merger. So uh, I will, 
uh, shift to the presentation. Um, so, okay, I suppose you can see it. I will hide my this thing. Okay, so uh, let's move forward. This is some picture um, from, actually we published two papers about, about this source. So the first one was a, a, a pure observational, um, observational comparison of GRP17 or A17A with, um, with other short GRPs, which were uh, supposed, so we have been associated with compact object mergers. But um, this is nothing new. Now, uh, after three years, we know uh, that in, in many, in, in many um, properties, this GRB is special or it, let's say, different from the other short GRBs. What, um, what is more impressive from our point of view is um, is the the, uh, the 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 energy which is has been uh, measured to be released in GRB seventeen or A seventeen A, which is uh, just uh, of the order of ten to the forty six erg, with respect to um, the highest energy measure in uh, in uh, in short GRBs, which goes all the way to a few ten to the fifty three erg. So it's uh, quite a challenge um, to try a such a huge excursion of energetics with us with the same model. I mean, if you try to apply a neutron star neutron star merger to all of these sources, then you have to explain how the same objects and you have neutron star neutron star merger, you don't have an scaling, for example, in mass. I mean, it's not that you are applying a model to a stellar mark black hole and to AGNs when you have a huge excursion of eight order of magnitude in masses, for example. If you are using the same model, so roughly same masses of the merging components. If you try to say continue to, I mean, that's really a challenge from some same have these constraints which are from the from the physical model itself to cover eight order of magnitude of differences and in energy. So uh, we prefer to think, uh, and we started from the beginning to think about it to see uh, whether these kind of sources, which has low, low energetics of the orbits of 10 to 46 Earth, um, are not neutron star, neutron star merged, but uh, instead they could be white dwarf, white dwarf mergers. So uh, this is uh, uh, what this uh, plot is, uh, is saying. Here you see, this is how the gamma rays uh, observed by Fermi of GRB 18, uh, 18 or 17A with respect to or a typical short GRB, for example, 0, 9, 3, 5, 10 and other sources. Um, let's move. So um, I'll move fast to the, we, we'll keep the presentation simple. Um, so our proposal was a white door, white door merger. So these are snapshots of our simulation that we that we made uh, two years ago to as a, as a prototype example of this kind of system. So it, it is not the only applied to 17 or A17A, but many other transients that we could see or uh, high energies or with systems um, uh, with these kind of features that I'm going to show now. So um, as in, in the case of any merger, what you see, what is important for us um, here, are, and maybe see I have here is, what are, is, is important for these simulations, the formation of a new object here which is the generate, so it's a high dense object. And the other feature which is important for us is, uh, uh, is the, the matter which is expelled, the ejecta from the merger. So just mentioned, so you have um, form a degenerate central remnant. This is a newer white dwarf that can be stable or can be metastable. This depends on the merging component. So you can have a subchandra uh, sub Chandra Sekar White Dwarf or a Super Chandra Sekar White Dwarf. In that case, we will be short lived. In the case of the stable, it can be long lived. And that's the case we are, in, what we are going to adopt here for this source. And the central remnant uh, is, uh, is fast rotating. So, uh, fast rotation for a, new, for a white dwarf, we are speaking about rotation periods of the order of Q1 and 10 seconds. And the magnetic field of the white dwarf can be all the way to giga gauss. And this is not uh, nothing new. I mean, we uh, observe white dwarfs with magnetic fields up to the up to giga gauss. 
So, and the ejecta are typically of the order of 10 to minus three solar masses. This is not because we observe that ejecta from a white door, white door merges, but because this comes, this number comes from a numerical simulation. And uh, so I'm going to show uh, G, from this G, from the analysis of 17 or A17A, it, it, it turns out that 10 to the minus three solar masses is exactly what you need to explain the, the afterglow of this source. So um, these are the, 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 the ingredients and the physical process that work in, in, this, in this model. So the, I mentioned the, the generative remnant is to be highly degenerate, so it's massive, uh, but still sub chandra uh, object. So it's printing with a mass between 1.1 1 .1 and 1.3 solar masses, roughly, and then fast rotate, and I mentioned, and magnetic field. The expansion velocity of the ejecta, okay, the third point here, which I mentioned already, the first two, the third point, it's a, a speed the expansion of this, of the, of the uh, unbound matter is of the order of, uh, of 10 to minus two uh, speed of light. So 10 to, 10 to the eight centimeters per second. Um, and, and since you have this uh, newborn white dwarf, which is massive, fast rotating and, um, and highly magnetized, then uh, very likely you have this injection of energy from this central engine. It will be a central, uh, a central uh, source which is powering the ejecta, and this goes uh, very, very much into the in the lines mentioned by 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 Elena in the in her last uh, two or three slides. But this is uh, this is not new. Actually, this was this kind of uh, energy injection and the appearance. Of this central object, we uh, we predict that in our in our two papers of 2018 and 2019. So um, this is about the central object and the ejecta. So, but what are the physical the physical um, the physical processes that will will lead to the mission? So, of course, we have a, a prime mission in the gamma rays in this object. So that could be um, a magnetospheric flare. Um, uh, so it is. Uh, relatively simple to make a back of the envelope calculation or estimate of the energy that you have to do to, to, to for, for uh, emitting magnetoscopic flares. And it, it turns out to be exactly of the order of 10 to the 46 air for a magnetic field of 10 to the 9 gauss in the magnetosphere of the, of the merging uh, neutron star, the white dwarfs. And then, uh, of course, this magnetic flare it has to it has to expand, and this is uh, this is uh, this is uh, possibly this is in our in our model the the only component which is uh, ha could have a relativistic motion. So is the only the only part of our model which is uh, which has a, a, a Lorentz factor uh, um, larger than one at when than unity. Um, the early afterglow, uh, the early afterglow is the optical emission of the kilonova. Uh, I'm going to show for us is only this thermal cooling. So here we have an ejecta from a white door, white door merger. So we don't expect uh, it is uh, uh, our process, our, our process, uh, uh, our process elements, and, and therefore there is no decay from our process elements, but it's just the thermal cooling of the ejecta, which is this ejecta, as I mentioned, is powered by the central object. Um, then the late afterglow is consistent with a synchrotron cooling and the white dwarf uh, pulsar emission. So you will uh, find that some of these, uh, some, uh, that this, this model has some, um, share some properties with the, uh, uh, with the um, uh, model of uh, that uh, in Elena's presentation. Uh, with, of course, with the difference that here we are speaking about white dwarf, white dwarf mergers and only transstar star, star mergers. These are uh, the typical uh, typical light curve. So this is not a fit of the sort. This is just from some uh, typical parameters of this of this model. So here I, I show um, what would be the emission expected from uh, from uh, 10, 10 to the nine, um, say roughly ten to the nine Gauss uh, white dwarf um, with a period of the order of, of three seconds. Um, in injecting energy into this eject expanding at, at zero point zero one C. And, uh, and so this uh, helps you see some um, features, some, some uh, cures here in the gamma rays. 
So from 30 MeV, these are, I show some, here are some, some bands, which are, are, are um, uh, typical of the instruments that uh, oh yeah, observe uh, GRP. So we are here, so we are here at uh, Fermilat, uh, Agile, here with Fermi GBM, um, here is Swift Factor T, and then you have the optical, optical emission uh, in the R band, you have the, the infrared, and the infrared as a Hubble Space Telescope band is uh, this blue one. Uh, then, then uh, I'm sure here also this is uh, the radio, radio, radio luminosity of 15 gigahertz. And then you have also the wider pulsar. Wider pulsar is for wider pulsar and just this uh, magnetic breaking uh, emission, so typical pulsar emission that we, um, here you see this as a flat, is just because the characteristic spin down time scale here is uh, longer than 10 to the seven seconds. So uh, still you see just the power uh, flat. And then I plot here this uh, thin red cube, see? That is the sum, so of the, the synchrotron in X-ray and the sum and and the um, and the pulsar luminosity. So this is what we uh, we predict uh, was the possibility that we advanced in two years ago that this uh, the 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 white dwarf pulsar could emerge around this time and produce a flattening of the X rays. So so these are uh, or typical likelihood. These are typical spectra. Uh, uh, and this is as a function of time. So you see there is a, a typical hard to solve evolution um, here. And but they are uh, essentially they are synchrotron, uh, synchrotron spectra. This is instead um, the fit, some the fit of or a specific fit of the source of, uh, of GRB 17 or 817A. So let me try to specify here some of this so of this uh, data. So uh, here we have the points in the 0, 3, 10 keV band. These are X rays. While here we have these are the kilonova points, these orange points, the R band. Here we have the infrared in the in the HST uh, HST band HST measurements over there, and then we have here the radio emission in uh, at three gigahertz and five point five gigahertz. And then this point here is representing the, the luminosity observed by Fermi GBM. So as you see, uh, we don't touch this point here because we expect to, this is explained by the magnetospheric flare, flare but magnetospheric flare. So is not uh, to be expected, is not expected to be explained by this mechanism. So what I'm showing here are the light cubes um, produced by the expanding uh, expanding ejecta being powered by the central object. Uh, and this, uh, of course, this, um, this ejecta is expanding the magnetized medium produced by the central object itself. Uh, so it's produced, it's so it's, it cools down uh, by synchrotron cooling, but also by thermal cooling in, during its expansion. So, so that's why uh, we are not interested in, the, in fitting this point with this mechanism, of course. And so the high energy uh, bands, uh, high energy emissions are, are down here. You can see that we cannot explain, this is only, this we cannot explain with this part, with only synchrotron cooling here, this early, this is the kilonova emission, right? This is the kilonova emission. So what's happening here? We don't have observation on this point, but we have also this rising part of the X-rays and of the radio emission that they also uh, uh, Elena showed before. Uh, uh, this is, could be some uh, indication of the, because these are uh, uh, unabsorbed light cubes. So there could be some absorption in the material, so I mean opacity. And so this actually, this emission it, uh, becomes a heating source for the ejecta itself at early times. So if we do that, for example, assume that this matter is not observed, it's not being released at this time, but it is it, it, it's going to, to heat up the material at this time, we can compute what the evolution, what the thermal cooling of the, of the ejecta would be in this case, in the early part. 
I'm going to show that in a moment. This is um, uh, at zoom. Um, this is at, at zooming into this region here, just to show better what they did, how the, 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 the theoretical model compares with the data around these values. And uh, here you see that. So you see, this is the infrared, uh, infrared data. And this is the radio data. You see here that the Elena show also this radio data. And uh, these are the X-rays. And this is already, uh, these are already the late the latest measurements that uh, Elena showed. This in, in let's say uh, enhancement of the of the of the X-ray uh, X-ray emission that for us is a signature of the emergence of the white dwarf pulsar that you see here in green, because the synchrotron emission, the synchrotron cooling, definitely is fading and cannot explain such kind of flattening, which was actually predicted in our, let me go back a moment to the, to our paper. Uh, sorry, because I, I didn't plan to show that, but it's, it's always instructed to show that. This was our paper two years ago in which we were showing the flattening due to the presence of the wider pulsar, exactly for the, for the values of magnetic field and rotation period that we are uh, fi finding in our, in our feet here. So, um then we pass to this region. If we take this as a heating source for the source itself because of the opacity. And this is the mission. So these are, these are the data points of the Kilonova. Um, the, the AT 2017 GFO data in the different in the different bands. So um, you see that the, that the, broadly speaking, the, broadly speaking, the model is uh, is catching the the general features of this of this emission. But this model is extremely simple. We are not considering uh, our, uh, actually a density profile for the ejecta. We are not considering uh, different velocities. This is actually only a two shell models in which we consider two shells of different mass just to, to try to mimic a little bit some density profile and different velocities. Uh, actually, the velocities are, are, are roughly the same, and the two shells, one is 10 to minus three solar masses, and the other one is 10 to minus, 14, 10 to minus four solar masses. This is an extremely simple, extremely simple model. And, and it's uh, actually, uh, I'm surprised that such a simple model can capture all these, um, this structure. And uh, so having said that, I will now conclude, mention some salient features of this model. So uh, gamma ray emission um, of 10 to the 47 air per second and the duration of one second, observed duration of one second, um, will be produced by a giant, uh, by giant flare um, in, the, in the merged magnetosphere. The magnetic field, uh, the magnetic field of the blob uh, would be of the order of gigagauss, and the size, size would be of the order of 10 to the 9, 10 to 10 centimeters, and expand with a Lorentz factor of the order of five. The, um, the afterglow, the late afterglow, is actually explained by thermal synchrotron cooling, further powered by the new by the newer white dwarf. Um, we see uh, the signature of the synchrotron emission very well in the constant slope observing the X optical and radio emission. This was one of the points also mentioned by Elena. The recent observed uh, rebrining of the X-ray emission or the flattening, let's say, of the X-ray is uh, for us is uh, uh, indicating the emergence of the, of the newborn white dwarf pulsar, but of which parameters? So the parameters of the newborn white dwarf are uh, um, um, mass of 1.3 solar masses, a rotation period of three seconds, and a magnetic field of a few of a few 10 to the eight gauss. We, um, uh, uh, as an output of the of the model, uh, we can compute the energy which was injected by the central object, and this energy is of the order of 10 to the 48 air, and this is this is uh, uh, consistent with the white dwarf rotational energy, which is of the order of 10 to the 49 air. This uh, progenitor, the progenitor of this, uh, that formed this, uh, this object 
can be um, can be constrained to this value, a double white dwarf with components, one point zero point six and the other one with a mass between 0 0.9 and 1.1 solar mass. Then uh, the early emission observing the optical infrared and ultraviolet, uh, namely the kilonova emission, is explained by the thermal cooling in which the, um, there is a heating com coming from the uh, coming from the from the emission which is reabsorbed by the by the material. And then we have inferred that the mass of the ejecta is about 10 to the minus three solar masses and the expansion is 0 0.01 C, which is uh, uh, consistent with, with, uh, with numerical simulations of, white dwarf, of, the, of the ejecta of, of uh, white, dwarf, uh, white dwarf mergers. This is uh, this. And then, uh, then the, one of the most interesting points is that these white dwarfs, White dwarfs with these uh, parameters, with similar parameters to these ones, uh, were, uh, uh, were proposed by, by, our, uh, by our group in 2012 as a, a possible uh, progenitors, as a possible explanation of the, of the soft gamma repeaters and anomalous X-ray pulsars, so the magnetars. Uh, we have a, a series of works on, on that. I mentioned only two of them, which were the first one, it was the main idea. And then there is a second one with the first example of which of a numerical simulation of, the, uh, of an AXP within this model. Um, therefore, what we are, since the white dwarf appears to be emerging uh, as a pulsar itself, so we advance the possibility that uh, actually could it, this, uh, this object, this white, new white dwarf could show in the future, actually, as an authentic SGR and or AXP in this uh, sky position. So this is a, a possibility, a prediction that we are advancing here, in view of the similarities of the white world properties with the ones that we were proposing for the explanation of of magnetars, and uh, that comes also as these uh, properties of this uh, Fermi GBM point, this flare. Uh, seems to be in some sense also very similar as the cell giant flares of, uh, of uh, magnetars. So this is, uh, I think this is my last slide. Yes, this is my last slide. So I stop here. Thank you very much, Jorge. And um, let's see. So should I should I stop my the sharing? No, no. I think we. Uh, I think we you you could uh, dialogue with Eleonora now. Let's uh, have uh, uh, Eleonora reaction and ask uh, questions. And uh, uh, if everything is clear, I think we should maximize the remaining time, uh, let's say 20 minutes or so, to clarify and to the model and to have questions from uh, Eleonora and you to Eleonora. I think the, the thing I can see immediately is uh, the different energetic of the two models, but maybe this can come out in the discussion. Leonora, can you intervene? We yeah, have um, manage, we, we have to manage ourselves. Yeah, so uh, one question I have is how this model accounts for the radio imaging. I, I don't think this was uh, showed in the slides, but how do you account for the centroid motion that was yes. measured? Uh -huh. Yes, I, I know you were going to ask this, but not uh, while I was preparing the slides, <laughs> while you were presenting. <laughs> uh, no, actually, we didn't include yeah. that. Uh, uh, and I, I, and I, I actually yes. was going to ask you some extra information about that. Um, because I, I was thinking, because we, did, we didn't at, uh, attack the pro this problem of the of the centroid uh, modes, but I, can you remember which is the Lorentz factor uh, um, um, uh, infer from the motion? No, sorry, I don't remember. I, I can check right now. If uh, if you take other question, I will check. <laughs> 
No, because I, I was thinking if it, that is, uh, uh, let me ask you, the points of the radio mission that of that imaging are the, the corresponding ones observed in, uh, uh, let me, um, around this region here? Well, I think it's in the early, earlier data. Or it's in the earlier data. Before 1000, I think. So the, the radio imaging was taken at, I think, about 100-ish and 200 days. Yes, so exactly. it was taken around the peak of the mission. Yes, no, we're here. No, we're here. Because, uh, um, because our model can uh, catch very well, you see, all this part. All this part. I, I was thinking if by any chance, um, while you were presenting, that this, this radio imaging could be, could be just the, the, the continuity of the flare that it was expanded yes. from the beginning. Yes. Because uh, there we estimate the Lorentz fa factor could be or the order of five. Yeah, I think uh, looking at the um, I mean, this, numbers, the, the I think the, the Lorentz factor they estimate is about four ish. About of four. Course. Okay, about four. So that's what I am thinking. That the, at the beginning we see the flare here in the gamma rays, and then and then it could it could it could show up around here in the in the radio as a, as a, uh, as a, in the radio with such Lorentz factor. The Lorentz factor seems to be correct. But before thousand, in the between ten and one hundred. So that could that could be a possibility. But that could be an explanation for the for that spot for the radio imaging. There is a question in the chat. Two questions. Can you answer? Oh, Can you... I, I don't know who, who is asking. Oh, oh Mo, uh, Maurice, Maurice Van Putten. In your white door, white door scenario, how do you account for the white for the gravitational wave merger signal observed by LIGO? Oh well, that is simple. <laughs> simple, we don't account. <laughs> we have an alter. <laughs> this model uh, just solved the GRB and uh, does not look at all to the gravitational wave. And we want to find an independent GRB motivation very clearly uh, fit in the data. And I think the most interesting part on which I return in the energetic, because we fit all this uh, data, maybe you should emphasize more this, okay. uh, the energetic is uh, uh, of the mass of the object, uh, 1.3 solar masses, the, the spinning period. And of course, this uh, pulsar behavior should uh, continue to appear. Uh, that's, I, 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 mentioned, I mentioned the energy. So we, um, um, the energy injection was of the, uh, of the order of 10 to the 40, 48 air and the rotational energy of the white dwarfs 10 to the 49. Uh, so of course uh, the white dwarfs can continue to, to radiate still for quite a while uh, after this. More is Van Putten, but the gravitational wave signal goes up to a few hundred hertz. Needs a neutron and star, neutron and star merger. Yeah, I mean, if you have a white dwarf, white dwarf merger, because white dwarfs are a little bit larger than neutron stars, when they merge, they do not produce frequencies up to a few hundred hertz. Of course, neutron stars are so compact, they easily produce frequencies in their final 
coalescence process up to a few hundred hertz, theoretically even more, but that's not detected. Yes. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, we're, we are not saying that the, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, that this system, this merger can explain, uh, explains that. I mean, we are not interested in explaining that at the moment. No, but my, my, the question I have is, if it is a Newton star, Newton star merger by virtue of gravitational waves, where do you place the white warp, white warp merger scenario in that case? No, not at all. No, no, the, no, no. There is no, <laughs> uh, uh, there are two steps. One, the assumption of uh, that, uh, uh, okay, you explain. There are, uh, 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 explain the logic, <laughs> I mean. Uh, yeah, um, I, I'm missing uh, a step here, yeah. No, it's, uh, I mean, the, the logic, uh, the, lo the, the, <laughs> the logic is uh, rel relatively simple. Okay, we can uh, we are making a model for the for to explain the electromagnetic properties which are observed. Okay, and I think we succeed in doing that with a white dwarf white dwarf merger rather than a neutron star neutron star merger. So if you go try to to explain with a neutron neutron star neutron star merger, you will see. Uh, 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 some problems in the explanation of the data, okay? The yeah, current but models, but if you're you trying agree? to unify, so no, unify but that. You, but wouldn't you agree that the gravitational wave signal uh, indicates we are looking at a Newton star, Newton star merger rather than a white dwarf, white dwarf merger? That's my starting point. Well, let me, let me say the opposite, that, that the electromagnetic emission is showing a white dwarf, white dwarf merger rather than a Newton star, Newton star merger. And, uh, and we don't want to start the discussion uh, uh, about who came first and so forth. I mean, no, no, data, no, 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 I'm not talking about the, that. I'm the, data, that. The, data no, are, I... the data are very clear. There was a signal from a Fermi, an integral at a given moment, and uh, we develop a model which can explain the data of Fermi and integral self-consistently with the spectrum of prediction, simple. We don't want to enter the, the, uh, another political discussion about uh, anything. I mean, we are interested in physics. The data, no, I, I, I know. The, the, data the, the data fortunately are very clean the electromagnetic data, and we explain this data. We are not interested in the gravitational wave signal. Well, but that's, I mean, normally you would take into consideration all the observational data of an event. So well, excluding I, 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 the gravitational wave data is, is maybe um, not the normal way of doing it. Excuse me, the gravitational wave data the, uh, people will have to explain uh, what uh, what this data came from and uh, and and so forth. I mean, there was a problem. Uh, it's well known. It's not the problem we address. We well, I don't know. No, but I think state, in this particular case, we state very clearly. No, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. But but in this particular case, we, we find independently the signal claimed by LIGO by a completely different model independent analysis. So I think the idea that it is a neutral star, star merger is quite firm. And we find it in each individual gravitational wave H1 and H2 detector. So, because the signal is so loud. So basically you would, you would have to discount this, this merger signal clearly present in two independent detectors. That's a tall yes. order. That's my point. You, you, you are right. We discard, we discard that signal and we have some reason to do that. But it's not, yes, we declare very clearly that uh, if our model is correct, we have to discard the gravitational wave signal. And if somebody else approach this political problem and so forth, because that will take uh, uh, there are people making a profession out of that. It's not our profession. 
Our profession is we look at the data from Fermi and from uh, and we don't uh, and from integral and we have no intention to discuss uh, the gravitational wave signal uh, because in our opinion they are not related to the source. Well, as you know, there is a it's a it's a limited it's a like I think five point one sigma association. So if you like, there is a, a small window, one in a million, that these events are not related. No, 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 not very no. large. No, excuse me, but again, uh, we have said whatever is appropriate to say. But uh, I think uh, there is a, a, a very big problem about uh, human intervention in physics, and we don't enter into that. We just say we consider the presence of uh, a, a space-time uh, process, which the future and the past, and human intervention, which has reversed the natural, the official, the space-time coordination, a reason not to enter into that problem. It's very difficult to enter the problem of a signal, five signal, whatever you like, where there has been Ponte Corvo used to stress this point. I was always remember Bruno smiling. In this, uh, in this phenomena, he was referring to not to this process, but to a different process, smiling, he was saying, there is a human intervention. I appreciated more and more this beautiful sentence of Ponte Corvo. Well, that human intervention then should come at the level of the detector because our analysis is model independent, done completely independently. And we confirm uh, in both individual detectors the existence of this characteristic. Oh, so in, both the, in both the detectors, uh, there has been a human intervention, period. In both the detectors, there has been a human intervention. You know all these things. I mean, uh, go and speak about the glitch and so forth, but this is not the matter I want to speak. Uh, I don't want to enter in the glitch and the human intervention. Let's stick to this fact. If you take the GRB 17 or 417 by Fermi and uh, um, integral, which is a very clean signal, we can explain this as a binary white dwarf, and we predicted a bright spectra and which can express, this is the important point, by our formulation uh, uh, of synchrotron radiation, the observed properties, quite remarkably well going from the X to the radio to the optical. It's not so org. And we can make even a prediction of what will happen in the future months. Then uh, everything else will be discussed in a different, uh, in a different, in a different, uh, in a different uh, occasion. And so there are plenty you... of discussion. Yeah. Well, what do you propose to go forward? Wait for another event, for instance, or? What do you mean another event? We don't, we don't have, excuse me. We have up to now in gravitational wave, one event in 1509-14. Spectacular. Absolutely, um, absolutely uh, clear. The only problem is that it happened the first day of open, the first few days of opening of light was never again happened. It's very clean. In analyzing again the physics of that event, we find a difficulty, theoretical difficulty, which we publish with Rodriguez. This is not new because it was the same case which we encounter with the Weber event and the solution by Misner. Misner did a fantastic work of synchrotron gravitational radiation 
from the black hole in the galactic center. Today, we don't believe any longer the black hole or galactic center. And we prove that Misner made a mistake and that was the end. In the same case, in the case of 1509-14, we have published a paper in showing that there is a paradox because they were two parts glued together, what we have called in the existence of uh, a, 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 a mythical man horse component. A, a, Centaurus. A Centaurus. I mean, we, we published, this is published, and this has a difficulty. Therefore, this is very serious in our opinion. And this is what we said today to uh, um, ex explicitly to Laguna. And uh, this is the sentence I use at the beginning of the gross. But now we are in a situation very similar. We have on one side traditional physics, which is uh, Fermi, integral, radio, X, uh, optical data, clear evidence for synchrotron, which we have been able to reproduce completely. And we, are, we have done that and, and, uh, and we are ready to publish also the details. But then we have another, another set of data, which uh, as Ponte Corvo said, had a human intervention. Personally, and this is a very personal point of view, I discard process with human intervention, personally. And we are not interested. We are only interested to say that if indeed the data of X-ray and uh, uh, of uh, inter, uh, integral and Fermi are explained in our way, there is no room possibility of having the gravitational wave phenomena with human or not human intervention, but uh, uh, unfortunately with human intervention. Therefore, I think our stand is very, is very clear. Everybody can judge. All three events, the, the, the Misner effect, the effect of 15 or 9, 14, fortunately, there are few, 17 or 8, 17. We don't want to wait for any, uh, any other one. The only thing I said this morning is that uh, the quality, unfortunately, of the data, of the recent data, the quality of the recent data of a few days ago, are not similar to the clean data of 15 or 9, 14, or of Weber, or of 17 or 8, 17. They are not oh, clean. Those, those distances were very, very far out. If, if, uh, to uh, they are not kind of clean. Therefore, we, uh, as, uh, as uh, I don't want to use a word, uh, a word, uh, 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 a, a, a word of uh, of uh, of Wigner or another word by by another great man that you will find in the literature, but uh, we have no possibility on this quality of data to establish if the solution is uh, correct or not correct. Actually, in the previous case, the data were good enough to say that the interpretation was wrong. In this case, recent, we are not even able to establish if these data are wrong or not. This is the key point. It's dramatic. It's really dramatic. But this does not mean that we can do good physics. Because when they are good data, we can definitely say if 
the, the interpretation of the data fulfill basic physics equation. If not, the, the data are good, but the interpretation is wrong. This is what I prove on Misner, and this is what we prove on 15 or 9, 14. And we will prove in the case of 17 or 8, 17, fortunately, that the data of uh, Fermi and, uh, and uh, Integral, and of course, the splendid data in the... In the in the, the Chandra, fantastic data of Chandra. Without Chandra, we will ne never have dream mm. to go back to our model. I mean, it's been uniquely, and this uh, I ask, uh, I, uh, I was very grateful for Leonora to accept uh, our invitation because she was the one with the Chandra team to extract this uh, very important data, and they will be even more important from now on. And I have to compliment Eleonora to have done this analysis of the data. It was really uh, fantastically important. The data now are good. And when the data are good, <laughs> the theory uh, uh, the theory must match the data without violating physical law and without, in my opinion, a human intervention. By definition, a human intervention uh, cancels the validity. Now, I don't want to enter into the story that I heard from Kip Thorne, who told him in the morning, uh, 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 the reality, the discovery of 15 or 9, 14. I overheard this discussion of Kip Thorne when we went to Stockholm for the price of uh, um, Roy Kerr. We were in the same taxi and somebody asked Thorne, but how it happened? He said, well, I was sleeping seven o'clock in the morning and somebody, he gave the name, called me. He said, we have a signal. This was 15 or 9, 14. And Ton asked, are you sure that is not an injection? And this person, because Torn gave me, gave the name and I have, uh, I have written all this, this person said, oh no, was not injected. I am the responsible for the injection. This is what I heard from Tom. Therefore, I don't want to enter this story. This story is very dreadful and uh, it's a very tragic story of physics. And I think we have to face the courage to put uh, clear this, this, which could be very well one of the greatest disaster in the history of physics. Well, I would still invite you then to look at our paper because in our independent analysis, we found something beyond the merger. So if indeed anything of a merger was injected, then uh, actually more was observed in the injection. That doesn't seem to be very consistent with uh, human intervention. Actually. Of course, I will, uh, I will, I will look uh, at your paper, like and, I, and the uh, signal that we find post merger was completely unexpected, actually for, for ourselves as well, but definitely for LIGO because LIGO doesn't have the software that has the required sensitivity to be at similar sensitivity for binary mergers, so they didn't see anything. And we, we do find observational evidence which we published in this actual letter. Excuse me, uh, let's do one thing at a time. We are just not entering in this matter. I repeat, I repeat, and that you cannot, uh, uh, what we, I said already. And, uh, and uh, no, I do not repeat what I said already because it's recorded. 
If you like, you can go back. But I think the situation is very, very clear. And uh, there is a position I borrow from Ponte Corvo. Well, I mean, uh, on another occasion, I'll be happy to discuss this further with you because I think there are more issues at play than that you brought up. And maybe that is helpful to, to this discussion. Good. Any other occasion will be welcome. Maybe we, we will have an occasion, as I announced, I don't know if you are in Korea, but from yeah. the second, you are in Korea, beautiful. Uh, well, if you... From the end, from, at the beginning of August, I announced we have the meeting at, in a university, in a beautiful campus in Korea, and uh, I sh show yes, uh, today the poster, and I will show again tomorrow. It will be a pleasure to uh, see each other. I don't know if I can come with this uh, problem of uh, pandemia, but uh, certainly uh, now we are experienced how to have meetings uh, covering the pandemia at a distance, and we will have certainly the meeting, uh, uh, the meeting uh, in uh, uh, Korea at the distance. Was, the only, the, the yeah, only, I mean, the only thing I am sad after seeing the poster is that it's in a beautiful uh, uh, land, uh, 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 island, uh, which I think I visited before, which is very beautiful. And uh, this is the only sorrow I have not to, eventually not to be able to come, but I will try to do my best. But anyway, we will have plenty of occasion to speak. Well, I mean, it, yeah, if you invite me to give a talk, I'll be happy to elaborate on this in any detail that you, you wish, and then we can compare notes. Well, I think now we have enough notes from what we said. May, and... may, may I say something? I want to yeah, just absolutely. to uh, done so this. I will just just to thank uh, Eleonora because uh, because her presentation was very elucid elucidating for me. Uh, um, so I, I I I'm really very thankful. And uh, let me express the same. I didn't. I think I I I have the same the same feeling l listening to Eleonora presentation. There was a point very interesting, and uh, not one point, many points. But I would like, I would like also to say to Eleonora, you have been the hero to find, to elaborate all the data from Chandra. And uh, I expressed that also to a member of our committee, International Organizing Committee, I said, Chandra did really something exceptional, even in this last, last, last phase, fantastic. And uh, she did not realize how your work was important. I will come back to her. Maybe you know who is she. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone. And Thank I you hope... very much for these nice words. Yes. Okay, see you soon somewhere. Where are you these days? California? Now I'm in Colorado. Ah, really, I envy you. I envy you. And it nice. uh, must be very beautiful. Maybe too hot. Is too hot? No, not yet. No, no. it's just beautiful. Okay, yeah. enjoy. Enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Okay, this was extremely important. Bye. So we close the connection. Okay, thanks for the discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye.